This was the town of Belchite in Spain. When the Spanish Civil War ended in 1939, it was left in its ruins to serve as a memorial to the devastation of Spain in one of the most savage civil conflicts Europe has ever seen. The Civil War lasted from 1936 to 1939. It cost perhaps half a million lives. It ruined cities, towns and villages. For some, the victors, it was a crusade against godless revolution. For others, the defeated, it was a struggle against the forces of reaction that had oppressed Spain for generations. The Spanish Civil War still haunts the world's imagination. Many came to see it as the prelude to the Second World War, the first battle between democracy and fascism. Thousands of volunteers came to fight and die in a foreign land for ideals they believed to be their own. But the Spanish knew that the war had Spanish causes. It was, after all, their country that was ruined their history that exploded. Forty years on, the dictatorship has dissolved and the survivors can speak more freely. They can question some of the myths. They can evoke something of what they saw and understood during the Spanish Civil War. On July 17th, 1936, a group of army officers rebelled against the government of the Spanish Republic. Workers took up arms to fight the rising. And what began as a military coup led to almost three years of civil war. For both sides, political opponents became enemies to be hunted down and killed. The Republic, the Niña Bonita, the beautiful girl. Five years before the Civil War, joyful demonstrations throughout Spain greeted the proclamation of the Republic. The monarchy had fallen without violence. To the crowds, the Republic meant that Spain had broken through to the 20th century, to progress, to a long-delayed victory for social and economic change. It was an April day, spring-like. It was a mild day with sunshine. So we walked, and there were huge throngs of people in lorries, the few cars that there were in those days, in trams. And then, unexpectedly and surprisingly, Republican flags appeared everywhere. Nobody knew where so many had come from. While the crowds rejoiced, King Alfonso was spending his final hours in the royal palace. Only weeks before, 
He had led the solemn Palm Sunday ceremonies, unaware that the monarchy was doomed. Over the years, one part of Spanish society after another had lost faith in the monarchy. The middle class despised Alfonso XIII for tolerating a seven-year military dictatorship. The ruling classes now fear the king can no longer protect them. And for the workers out on the streets that day, the monarchy was the clamp holding an oppressive system together. Two days before, on April the 12th, royalist parties were heavily defeated in local elections. Suddenly, the king understood his own isolation. While Spain rejoiced, he went unresisting into exile. The king was replaced by a government of mostly middle-class liberals. But their plans for an advanced democracy were out of step with history. Elsewhere in Europe, liberalism was weakened by economic depression, poisoned by dictatorship. The government was releasing huge forces in this tightly repressed society, the class hatreds of the agrarian poor and of the rapidly growing working class. Yet these republican optimists and their socialist allies thought that orderly reforms would soon transform the nation. Justino de Azcarate was a member of that first republican government of 1931. There was this feeling of freedom. For many years, publications had been subject to censorship and academic freedom had been restricted. Now there was a general trend towards freedom and also new laws to create a social and economic order that would be more just and more egalitarian. The farm laborers and the industrial workers underpaid, almost unprotected, and frequently unemployed, hoped that the Republic would immediately end exploitation and break the power of the old ruling classes. Narciso Julian was a young socialist at the time. The birth of the Republic brought great hope among the working class that their aspirations would be satisfied. That was the main feeling among industrial workers and peasants. For centuries, peasants had longed to own land, the industrial workers wanted their union rights recognized, the right to strike, to a fair salary, to social benefits that they didn't have, social security and so on. So here were all these social and economic problems that had to be solved. The arrival of a democratic regime of the Republic meant so much for a vast majority of workers, the hope that all these aspirations would come true. For many, the Republic seemed already the revolution. But the Republic's leaders knew that under the new political surface, the pillars of the old society remained untouched. A powerful and deeply conservative church hostile to change. An army accustomed to having the last word in politics. A possessing class determined to defend its privileges. Southern Spain, above all, was an area her big estates, rich landowners. Many were hated by the landless farm labourers, nearly three quarters of a million of them for whom daily survival was a struggle. On the one side there was a huge number of impoverished labourers and on the other a few landowners. And this meant tremendous humiliation to the point where labourers here were hired as though they were cattle in a market. Because 
It was virtual slavery, because there were no fixed wages. They paid what they wanted to pay. In many families, children went to bed hungry, because you didn't get paid enough. You weren't paid enough for subsistence. The Republic knew that democracy might collapse if land was not divided more justly. But its complicated, cautious reforms disappointed farm workers while alarming the landlords. Well, the main reason was that the Republic, right from the very start, was totally opposed to rural property. It campaigned against rural property. You see, under the Republic, more and more people believed in the slogan, neither property, nor God, nor bosses. And that's nearly revolutionary language. That's how it really was at the time. So it's quite natural that landowners would resist this. It's quite understandable. The landless have an inborn desire to own land. So the Republican propaganda about land reform raised a lot of interest and immediate support. They felt very frustrated when reform didn't take place. So much so that they then tried to grab land. Well, they not only tried, they did occupy land. The landless poor were impatient to take over the fields that the Republic hesitated to give them. Was there a chance for gradual change without violence? One land reform official, Jose Vergara, was soon disillusioned. I believe that it is impossible to carry out an agrarian reform without a revolution which dismantles the existing political and social structures in a country where the land is owned by a small group of people who constitute an influential social sector you have to fight for the land you will not be given it voluntarily in the same way that those who do not have land fight for it, those who possess it fight to preserve it. The turmoil in the countryside challenged the fabric of society and the church. Farm workers like the urban poor often saw the priest as the ally of the landowner or the factory owner. But the church still held the respect of the rich and powerful, and of many humble Spaniards as well. There was as much reverence as there was hatred. It was said that Spaniards always followed their priests with a candle or with a club. But anti-clericalism, a fanatical determination to break the hold of the Catholic Church over society, united liberal Republicans and socialists alike. It was a principle on which the Republic refused to compromise. Less than a month after the proclamation of the Republic, this resentment against the church erupted in violence. Following a riot outside a royalist club, mobs set fire to half a dozen convents in Madrid. Those were the churches where we had gone to Mass, had our first communion and been baptized. Yes, the day the convents were burnt was terrible, full of sadness and anguish. Our feelings were aggravated by the knowledge that it was being condoned. Nothing was done to stop it. The mobs were burning churches and convents and nobody intervened. It was a terribly sad day. As the convents were burned and looted, the police stood by and watched. Manuel Atania, then Minister of War, said that day that all the churches in Spain were not worth one Republican life. Words like these were never forgotten or forgiven. Nearly half the population was illiterate. The Republican government set about building a non-religious state education system. The church's hold over mines was to be broken. In the first years of the Republic, nearly 10,000 schools were opened. 
Soon the Republic was taking art and culture to every corner of Spain. La Baraca was part of this offensive. The Spanish intellectuals were eager to act as the Republic's missionaries of enlightenment. Federico García Lorca poet and playwright took the theatre to remote villages. In Calderon's classic, Life is a Dream, Lorca played the part of the shadow. He was to be one of the Civil War's first victims. This cultural upsurge also gave fresh energy to regions which felt themselves distinct from the rest of Spain. Catalonia and the Basque country above all retained a proud awareness of their own histories. Since the turn of the century their demand for self-government had grown louder and angrier. As a student Marcel Giraud supported the Catalan autonomist movement. In the past, Catalonia had been an independent nation. We have a tradition of language, customs and culture very distinct from the rest of Spain. It's different at many levels. Added to this, there's the fact that we'd been dominated by outsiders who had shown no respect for our freedoms. Since the proclamation of the Republic on April the 14th, 1931, we'd been longing for these freedoms to be restored to Catalonia. Like the Basques, the Catalans were more industrialized and prosperous than the rest of the country. Yet they have been stifling under the backward, over-centralized rule of Madrid. Barcelona, the Catalan capital, was the centre of a thriving textile industry and a huge port. The Republic soon granted Catalonia home rule. The Catalans were encouraged to assert their national identity even more strongly. An army officer, Manuel Diez Alegria, was among those who feared that home rule would lead to the breakup of the Spanish state. The Catalans made silly mistakes, such as bothering people who went to Catalonia, telling visitors that they had to speak Catalan, things like that. All this created the impression that they might destroy the unity of the nation, given that they didn't hesitate to proclaim their separatist motives. National unity obsessed army officers. Spain had already lost most of its world empire. In the Moroccan wars of the 20s, it nearly lost one of its last foreign possessions. Francisco Franco helped to turn defeat into victory and became a general at the age of only 33. The Republic planned to reform the army, which was so archaic and top heavy that there was one officer to every 11 soldiers. The army regarded these changes with heavy suspicion, but it was a grant of self-government to Catalonia, which conservative officers saw as the most immediate threat to the unity of the nation. August 10th, 1932. General Sanjojo led an unsuccessful rising against the government. 16 months earlier, as commander of the police, he had decided not to resist the coming of the Republic. Now his action was a warning that the loyalty of the armed forces was coming under strain. General Sanjojo was imprisoned, 
but the government allowed him to entertain his family and supporters. In Madrid, the government's victory over the rising was celebrated with parades and demonstrations in support of the Republic. The San Jorge rising was premature. The right wing and the traditional powers in Spanish society were not yet ready to overthrow the Republic, but they detested the reforms and their alarm was growing. On the left, too, disillusionment was spreading. The hungry, the landless, the unemployed and the underpaid were beginning to confront the state openly. One source of this left-wing opposition was anarchism, gathered round its trade union, the CNT, born during the bloody social conflicts of Barcelona in the early years of the century. The CNT's creed was anarcho-syndicalism, the belief that revolution would lead to total worker self-management. Although the anarchist movement had weakened in the rest of Europe, in Spain it had prospered. By 1932, the CNT claimed over one million members. Federico Monsegna was a young anarchist leader. I believe there's something different, special, about Spaniards, created by the mixture of so many different races, by their history, and by constant oppression. They were oppressed first by feudalism, then by an all-powerful bourgeoisie, by an army that has always cast its long shadow over Spain, by the pressure of the church. And all of this has created a constant spirit of rebellion among Spaniards. It has driven them towards ideas of emancipation, towards revolutionary concepts of society and of life. When the Republic was proclaimed in 1931, the anarchists declared, we remain in open war with the state. They rejected all governments, monarchies or republics. They fought for a society of equal, cooperating human beings, freed from the curses of private property, God and bosses. In Spain, extremes of poverty created a climate ripe for revolutionary violence. In January 1933, anarchists led futile risings in several Andalusian villages. One of them was Casas Viejas. The police showed the villagers no mercy. Prisoners were shot. One house defended by anarchists was set alight and the occupants died. The blame for these tragedies was put on the Republican leaders. The socialists decided to pull out of the government, disgusted at scandals like Casas Viejas delaying the reforms and mounting unemployment. New elections were called in 1933. The socialist left was now losing faith in the whole parliamentary system. The anarchists had never believed in it anyway. Most of the right had not yet rejected parliamentary democracy. They hoped that by winning the elections, they could still halt and reverse the whole tide of events. A new party emerged on the right. It was called the Theda. This was Spain's first mass Catholic party. Its leader was the ambitious young Jose Maria Gil Robles, who had learned from the campaign style of the Nazis. The right wing made a supreme effort to bring out its voters. It was helped by women who were voting for the first time. Ironically, it was a liberal republic that had given them the franchise. The elections of November 1933 made Terra the largest party in Parliament. Gil Robles became the hero of conservative Spain. The government shifted right. The reform programme slowed down or went into reverse. The left was appalled. Behind Gil Robles, they suspected the shadow of fascism was waiting.
che oggi il popolo italiano e il regime fascista sono una unità compatta, imprendibile, formidabile che può sfidare come sfida tutti i suoi nemici e anche plantare del tempo. A 1934, fascism was reaching out across Europe. In Germany, the Nazis were crushing what opposition remained. The Spanish socialists were determined not to go down without a struggle. They imagined there would soon be jackboots on the streets of Madrid if Theda and Hugh Robles took power. When Theda did join the government in October 1934, the Spanish socialists decided to strike back. Socrates Gomez was a member of the socialist youth. Que había habido un proceso de regresión muy grave, muy grave en la política española y que estábamos y éramos conscientes. We felt there had been a serious regression in Spanish politics, and we were well aware that even without a civil war, fascism could come to power in Spain, perhaps camouflage behind politicians such as Gil Robles. And this is what led us to strike. Planteamientos y eso nos aconsejó el ir al movimiento huelguístico. You must realize that this wasn't just another strike for things like wages or better working conditions. This was a revolutionary strike, and our aim was to overthrow the government and take power. The socialists summoned the workers to rise against the elected government, but the insurrection was easily defeated everywhere, except in the northern mining district of Asturias. There, the whole left for once united in rebellion. Socialists and anarchists, communists and Trotskyists seized control and declared the revolution. The coal miners shut down their pits and marched out eagerly to fight for Red Asturias. Una alegría inmensa y así del público. We felt this tremendous excitement. We had dynamite ready to blow everything up, and everybody was behind us. The whole village was ready to go, even the kids, men, women, children, everybody. It was open war against the Madrid government. The miners drove back local army units and murdered some of their political enemies. But the government now sent Moroccan troops and the Spanish Foreign Legion into the battle. A fortnight after it had begun, the Asturias Rising had been broken. The fighting had ravaged towns and villages. General Franco helped to plan the government campaign. As the army fought its way along the Asturian valleys, the defeated miners were shown no mercy. The civil guard did it, and the army troops, and some of the local bosses who went with them pointing out suspects. They said, this one, that one. That was it. That's what happened. They killed all sorts of people. Nearly 2,000 people were killed in the Asturias Revolution. Some of them slaughtered in cold blood. Tens of thousands were marched off to prison. In Spain as a whole, the socialist-led rising had failed to get off the ground because the left could not act together. But the lesson of Asturian unity sank home. Over the next two years, the left drew closer together as to the government imprisoned opposition leaders and demolished their reforms. In 1936, with elections approaching once more, most of the left united in a popular front. The anarchists did not join but supported the popular front in order to rescue their own imprisoned supporters. On the right, Eurobles launched a noisy, confident campaign. He claimed that he alone stood between Spain and a murderous Bolshevik revolution. 
February the 16th, polling day, was a turning point in the history of Spain. As the results came in, it became clear that the Popular Front had won the largest block of seats. The release of political prisoners began. Dolores Ibururi, known as La Pasinaria, had been elected as a communist MP for Asturias. So then I went to the prison. The governor had run away, but his deputy was there. He said, I haven't received any orders. I replied, I'm the MP for Asturias. I was beginning to sound very grand. I said, please give me the keys. The prisoners are coming out today. He finally said, here they are. So I ran along the corridors of the jail, shouting, comrades, all out. It was very moving. All Barcelona turned out for the return from prison of Luis Companch, Catalonia's president. The working class parties refused to join the government. The left Republicans were now trapped between the panic of conservative Spaniards and the excited hopes of the workers. Strikes and land seizures broke out as workers tried to win back what had been lost in the last two years. As the prisoners marched out into the fresh air, the right concluded that Hill Robles' parliamentary politics had let them down. Conservative hopes now followed a new star, Jose Calvo Sotelo. But for some, the time for parliamentary compromise had already passed. Tomás Garicano Goni was a young conservative officer. I was not a member of any political party, but we felt there was no way out. As Gil Robles wrote later, peace was not possible. For me, this was only too true. And there's something else, perhaps too embarrassing to recall, but that one has to admit. At that time, we couldn't stand each other. Divisions and tensions had reached such a point that even seeing a socialist, not to mention a communist, was the same as seeing the devil. Some 15,000 members of Hill Robles' youth movement defected and went over to the Falanque, Spain's own fascist party, which had been founded by José Antonio Primo de Rivera in 1933. José Antonio insisted, even to audiences outside Spain, that he was not just copying fascism elsewhere. The movement we are initiating in Spain is not a copy of any foreign movement. It has learned from fascism what fascism has of the idea of unity, authority and substitution of the struggles among classes by the idea of cooperation. The climate of violence allowed the Falanque to flourish. Jose Antonio was arrested and the Falanque was banned. But they had helped to ensure that rioting and political murder became predictable when left and right collided. While men were using fists, stones, bullets to settle political arguments, they were also using direct action to escape from poverty. On the dry hills of Estramadura, the patience of the farm labourers now snapped. They surged out to occupy the land they had yearned for. On a single day, March 25, 1936, some 60,000 landless workers took over 3,000 farms. Revenge was in the air. The landowners feared that they could lose not only their estates, but their lives. And there was trouble brewing in Navarre, in the north of Spain, but this time from the right. The Carlists were traditional monarchists, whose catechism was God, fatherland and king, their own Carlist king. Fanatically religious, they were locked into a medieval view of the world. The Carlists had rebelled against a liberal monarchy in the 19th century. Now they were eager to overthrow this godless Red Republic. 
Amid the growing breakdown in law and order, some army officers resolved that they must act. The government had sensed the danger and posted some of the most disaffected generals away from the mainland. General Franco was sent to the Canary Isles. But General Moller was unwisely posted to Pamplona in the Carlis country. From here, Moller, al director, began the secret organisation of the plot. At first, Moller encountered reluctance among some key figures. He had assigned to General Franco the job of launching the rising in Spanish Morocco. Franco would take command of the Moors and foreign legionaries he had led in the 1920s. But Franco hesitated to commit himself. Ramon Serrano Sr. was Franco's brother-in-law. Franco pensó siempre en que había que estaba obsesionado. Franco was obsessed with the danger of communism. He was convinced that communism had to be stopped. But he was in no hurry. He thought the danger wasn't so imminent, and he was quite happy staying in the Canary Isles. May 1st, 1936. The parade was intended to show the Republic's enemies that the left had overwhelming strength. Nago Caballero, whom some call the Spanish Lenin, was the most extreme socialist leader. He was now calling for a revolution that would impose the dictatorship of the proletariat. The right was terrified. A mere spark could detonate the tension. During the parade, the cry went up that nuns had given poison sweets to the children. Crowds broke away and set fire to a convent. The government of the Republic was fighting desperately to stave off the collapse of the state itself, but the socialists still refused to join the coalition. The leadership of the Republic was now increasingly isolated. On June 16th, Jose Calvo Sotelo, the opposition leader, proclaimed himself in favour of a strong, integrated state which would end strikes, lockouts, starvation wages, and anarchic liberty. He ended by saying, many call this a fascist state. If it is, then I who share that idea of the state and believe in it, declare myself fascist. In Pamplona, July 7, 1936, brought the annual running of the Bulls, the festival of San Fermin. The crowds of visitors were good cover for Moller's emissaries. I received a message from a friend saying that they were all there having a good time and that I should join them as I had done in previous years. This was the coded message I was expecting. As the bulls plunged about the ring, Moller and his plotters were solving their last problems. The rising had been postponed as the Carlists squabbled about which flag they should march under, and some army officers still refused to betray the Republic. But Jose Antonio, after complaining that Moller's movement was too conservative for his radical fascism, had finally promised support. At last, Moller felt that he could go ahead. I met Mola and he told me everything was ready and the names of the officers who were assigned to each region. Franco, still in the Canary Isles, got a message to Mola. In the first days of July, July the 6th or 7th, Franco had sent a message to Mola, written on a piece of paper carried by a woman in her belt, saying, Geography, Tetuan insufficient. Franco, devious and prudent, was still calculating his own chances. This really upset Mola, el director. He was very irritated. He said, Franco will never get here in time. It will all be delayed and the government is going to break it all up. 
but the plan to ferry Franco to Morocco went ahead. The search for the right ferryman ended in the home counties, at Croydon Airport. Captain Bebb, a freelance pilot, was introduced to a gentleman from Spain. And um, he asked me if I was prepared to go to the Canary Islands to get a riff leader to start a, an insurrection in Spanish Morocco. Uh, I thought, what a delightful idea. What a great adventure. On July 11th, Captain Bebb took off from Croydon. By the night of the 12th, he had got as far as Casablanca on his way to the Canary Isles. But it was what happened in Madrid that night that unlocked the last gate to disaster. It began here, at the home of Lieutenant Jose Castillo. He was a left-wing officer in the assault guards, the Republic's own police force. His life had several times been threatened by right-wing extremists. It was nearly 9.30 at night. Castillo was leaving home to go on duty at the police station. No more than a 10-minute walk. He got no further than the corner. News that Castillo had been murdered soon reached the police station. Outraged, his comrades demanded that all right-wing extremists should be rounded up. Headquarters sent them a list. It was Lieutenant Leon Lupion who gave out the names to the arrest squads. A los oficiales que había por aquí les fuimos entregando. I handed out two or three names to each of the other officers, and they went off in police vans with several guards. A esa misión y al final. And finally, there was just one van left in the corner there, van number 17. Van 17 was the last to set out at three in the morning. Nobody knows who was on its list for arrest. All that is clear is that a van arrived at the home of the leader of the opposition, the right-winger Jose Calvo Sotelo. They asked him to step down to the station for questioning. He promised to telephone soon to his family. Unless, he added, these gentlemen blow my brains out. His dead body was dumped to the gate of the East Cemetery. It was not the authorities who had ordered his arrest. But there was no way the government could escape the blame. The leader of the opposition had been assassinated in the custody of the government's own special police. The Calvo Sotelo murder brought the fury of conservative Spaniards to its peak. Its timing, a malign coincidence, offered the army plot mass support at a crucial moment. Entonces, todas las dudas y vacilaciones que aún existían... It was then that all the doubts and hesitation about whether to call the uprising immediately or to wait for the disintegration to spread so that we would be more justified, all those doubts disappeared. Within hours of the murder, Muller dispatched a coded telegram. It read... On the 15th last, at 4 a.m., Helen gave birth to a beautiful child. Hidden here were the date, time and place of the uprising. July 18th, at 5 a.m., in Morocco. The Republican government knew that Spain was close to explosion. 
but it failed to take seriously the approaching spark, the military uprising. The left knew all too well what was coming, and the workers were already garrisoning party and trade union offices. At midnight, the socialist leader, Indelethio Prieto, with some of his colleagues met the Prime Minister, Casares Quiroga. They begged him to arm the people, but Casares thought this would fling away the last hopes of law and order. He refused. At dawn, on July 14th, Captain Bev took off from Casablanca. Destination, the Canary Isles. That same morning, the funerals of Castillo and Carvo Sotelo took place. Clenched fists for Castillo's coffin. The straight arm fascist salute for Carvo Sotelo. What remained a political middle ground in Spain was crumbling. Disaster now seemed inevitable. Juan Molina was an anarchist militant in Barcelona. We hadn't slept at home for several nights. We were grabbing what sleep we could on floors of the Union in our newspaper offices. We were waiting for the inevitable. In our newspapers, we were telling our members to be prepared. Everybody was ready because we knew the coup was bound to come. Josep Taradeas, the Catalan leader, called on the Prime Minister, but Casares Quiroga still refused to see what was about to happen. While we were chatting, news arrived of army unrest in Morocco. There were reports that some generals were about to rise, although General Franco's name still wasn't being mentioned. So then I told him, my friend Casares, I'm convinced that the army is going to rise against Spanish democracy. He said, I'm sure it won't. Casares Quiroga could not believe the generals would go so far. But on July 17th, the day before it was planned, the rising erupted here in Malia. Next day, it spread to other towns in Morocco, even before General Franco had arrived to lead the Army of Africa. The military plotters assumed that their coup d'etat would succeed swiftly. The government of the Republic, in turn, thought it was strong enough to stamp out this erratic rising. Both were terribly wrong. The rising spread to the mainland, and the rebel generals soon controlled great tracts of the countryside. But the workers were now at last given arms, and with loyal police units they defeated the military in most of Spain's industrial cities. There could be no rapid victory either way. The rising swelled into full-blown counter-revolution. On the other side, the workers now pouring out to the barricades were using their rifles for a Spain which was to become not just republican, but revolutionary. There was no way left to prevent the conflict which was to rage across Spain for almost three years. There could be no more negotiation, no compromise. It could only be civil war.
The war memorial in this small village in southern Spain bears the names of 95 civilians and local police. It was built in General Franco's time. It records the victims killed here behind the lines on just one side of Spain's civil war. Many died on the other side too, but their memorial had to wait until Franco was dead, 40 years after the war. Only then was it safe to admit you had opposed him. This mass grave of anonymous civilians who died in the terror that followed Franco's uprising was organized by one of the survivors. There are working men and women that are buried here that were shot here. While the war lasted, there was no memorial. It was a rubbish dump. We can't be sure exactly how many died, but from their relatives, we reckon there are about 500 bodies. The Civil War became the battlefield for international ideologies. Before then, it was Spain's own revolution and counter-revolution. Justice was swept away by random brutality. Historians say the war's dead could be as many as half a million. Half of them died in battle, the rest died by assassination, summary execution or massacre. In 1936, Spain was a republic, but in July that year, a group of right-wing generals tried to overthrow the government. Much of Spain was still deeply conservative and welcomed the army revolt. It was only five years since the Spanish monarchy had fallen. Democracy to Spain was new and desperately fragile. There had been several attempts to undermine it, but so far democracy had survived. The inspiration for this new army plot was General Moller. He had planned a swift coup d'etat, but it didn't come off. Around the country, some sections of the army stayed loyal to the Republic. So did half the Spanish people. The pattern for the division of Spain was set. At the centre of the plot in Pamplona, traditional monarchists and fascists joined the army rebels. So did the civil guard. A conservative Pamplona was very different from other parts of Spain. In Barcelona and Valencia, the rising was uncertain and disorganized, and workers took to the streets to help the loyal Republican police put down the rebellion. In conservative towns like Burgos, Valladolid and Salamanca, the rising succeeded, but in Valladolid only after local fascists had helped the army overcome workers' resistance. In those days, Spain's best troops were the colonial army of Africa, commanded by one General Francisco Franco in Morocco. The rebel Franco needed transport for his Moorish troops and a base on the mainland. It was provided when General Capo seized Seville and secured the vital bridgehead. The troops were taken there by German planes. In the capital, Madrid, the army rebels stayed in their barracks awaiting reinforcements. There was much civilian resistance to the revolt, but the Republican government hesitated. They feared the consequences of arming the people. The coup had missed the swift victory it had expected. The workers fought back. The coup became a civil war, and the resistance became a revolution.
Lora del Rio, 30 miles from Seville, was typical of hundreds of villages in southern Spain. The uprising took it by surprise. All we knew was that the train from Seville did not arrive. There were rumours that there was trouble in Seville, but nobody knew for sure. I remember that on the morning of the 19th, everybody, well, not everybody, but the workers asked, what's happening? And there was a lot going on in the streets. People were wearing their party badges, some with shotguns on their shoulders. I was working in the harvest when one of my brothers came and said, listen, Manolita, the revolution has broken out. But what revolution is this? It was on the 18th of July, he said. So everybody left the harvest and came to town. This is the man, Manuel Vázquez Guillén, who a generation later organized the village war memorial. He was a socialist. So were most of the laborers and peasants of Lora del Rio. This wasn't especially meaningful. The villages all around were political one way or another. But at the army rebellion, they all responded the same way. They set up revolutionary committees in the town hall to defend their villages against the soldiers setting out from Seville. They also seized the goods of the well-to-do and shared them out. A truck went out to all the shops, requisitioning all the merchandise. Everything was put together in a store, and all the people had to go there. Everybody was treated alike by the committee. Everybody got the same quantities per person, so many grams of rice, chickpeas or meat. <laughs> For meat, instead of killing animals, which we might later need for our work in the fields, we took the fighting bulls. We went and took the bulls because we didn't need entertainment. We only wanted food for the villagers, and we didn't want to use the cattle which were needed for working the land. Some people had never seen the color of cooked meat. They had seen it at the butchers, but never cooked. Very soon, people became tired of eating meat. Laura del Rio's revolution had its more unpleasant aspects. Right-wingers and landlords were locked up in the village jail. They were accused of rebellion. Some of the people who were taken were good people who gave work to everybody. Others were very bad. But they all ended up the same way. All the right-wingers were put in jail. All whom they believed to be on the right were also put in jail. There was a lot of hatred. Throughout many years of struggle between workers and masters, a lot of hatred had been accumulated. For generations, Spain had been a land of injustice, hunger and hate. This hate was not only in the countryside. In Barcelona, the rising gave the authorities a double problem. The city was the center of a popular anarchist movement, unique in Europe, that denied the principle of government authority of any kind. The anarchists had more than half a million supporters all over the country. To them, the army represented all the forces of reactionary Spain. So they took to the streets against the rebels and thus, by coincidence, found themselves in common cause with the loyal forces of law and order for the first time. It was a combination bound to have dramatic consequences. Anarchists led crowds of people towards the loyal police force to attack army divisional headquarters, where the local rebel leader, General Godet, was holding out. When he finally gave in, his surrender was broadcast throughout Spain. It encouraged resistance everywhere to the army coup. The anarchists stormed the artillery depot. The government tried to contain the situation by sending loyal civil guards, but crowds of people seized substantial quantities of weapons. For the first time in Barcelona, 
the people on themselves. This was a serious dilemma for the authorities of Catalonia. The region was governed by liberal politicians, the voice of the middle class. But the rebellion had been put down by anarchists with other working class support and the police force. The politicians had kept their heads down. Catalonia's president, Luis Compange, faced the situation virtually alone. Apart from his police chief, Federico Escofet. I went to see the president and I said, all right, the rebellion has been put down. There's only the odd patch of local fighting, but of minor importance. And then he said, all right, yes, Escafet, that's fine. But the CNT fine now rule the streets. The CNT Fi, armed anarchist organizations dominant in the streets, made the government powerless. This was the awful dilemma. If the legitimate administration wanted to restore its normal authority, Escofet's men would have had to turn on the very comrades in arms who had helped save the Republic. I told the president, how can you hope to fight these people? We'd have to have a fight as fierce as the one we've just had, and we've got so many dead and wounded. Besides, they have fought side by side with those people. How can you ask me to order them to fight against them? I'm quite sure that even if I did, they would not obey me. What happened in Barcelona was critical for the development of the war. The right-wing army rebellion had created a revolutionary fervor of resistance. The army surrender in Barcelona released forces that the ordinary democratic republic could not contain. While the rebellion's defeat in Barcelona was the republic's first victory of the war, Madrid, the capital, was in suspense. On the morning of the 19th of July, the new Prime Minister, Hidal, had at last given the order to arm the people. The socialist and anarchist trade unions were issued with 65,000 rifles, but only 5,000 rifles have boats, and you cannot fire a gun without its boat. The missing parts were in the Montaña barracks in a dominant, threatening position near the center of Madrid. The commander refused to hand them over, so the barracks were stormed. Very soon the white flag appeared. One section of the barracks seemed to want to give up, but firing continued from another section. People were pissed off about the way the rebels had used a white flag and deceived them. Many people had been killed because of that. So when they finally entered the barracks and saw an officer surrender, they shot him. It was a logical reaction, wasn't it? In the courtyards, I saw a number of corpses, of course. Some of the soldiers had resisted, and they were executed just like that. There's no doubt about it. Unrestrained vengeance. Spontaneous execution of the enemy. This, in the early months, was the way of the Civil War. Many defenders of the Republic set themselves outside its law and sought a revolutionary justice out of the barrel of a gun. The uprising was defeated in five out of Spain's seven largest cities. They stayed loyal to the Republic. It was different with the conservative Catholic peasantry. They supported the army coup. There were two Spains now. Republicans held the north and a vast area southeast of Madrid. The rebels held the area north of the capital and the southwest. From both zones, columns of troops and armed civilians rushed to confront the opposition. The tactics of both sides were crude, informed only by passion. From Madrid and Barcelona to defend the Republic, from the conservative hinterland to crush it. Once they had more or less cleared Madrid of resistance, they decided to go out to the mountain passes to halt the advance of the column heading our way. And it was all still very festive.
The first days it was like a great party. A party in honor of the revolution, you might say. And I remember how people called each other. Earlier in the morning you would hear voices. Manolo, Paco, Antonio, and the windows would open. I'm coming. And he'd do up his overalls, put on his cap, fix his cartridge belt, and climb into the lorry and head off to the hills to fight the war, and then come back for the night. They used to return home to sleep. And the women would say, Paco's gone off to the front today, and I made him a potato tortilla, and he's taken a few bottles of wine. People went off to the front as though it was a picnic. The casual gaiety of Republican volunteers from Madrid was matched by the enthusiasm with which civilians who supported the rebels set off to try to capture the city. Among them was Juan Crespo. We bought overalls for our uniform. We went to the barracks where they gave us our ammunition belts and the rifles. We thought it was going to be such a walkover that we joked we were going for a coffee in Madrid, like someone going to a dance, because that's what it was for us. As well as being a bit of a trip, it was going to a dance. It was as if there was a competition between the columns setting off from different points. From Burgos, from Pamplona, from Valladolid, from Salamanca, we were all heading for Madrid, and the race was to see who would get there first, as if there were only 300 cups of coffee waiting. We came back from the front whenever we liked. Then we'd hand in our rifles and calmly go home. Nobody stopped us because we weren't dressed as soldiers. And we weren't soldiers. We weren't formally enlisted. But of course, that soon ended. General Mola turned us into soldiers, put us under military authority. But at the beginning, it didn't exist. As the man said, General Mola had to turn his insurgent irregulars into some kind of disciplined body. They became one force and called themselves nationalists. On the other side, of course, the Republicans too had to become a proper fighting force, but that was more difficult. Each political party or trade union recruited its own volunteers into the militia units. Anarchist columns under leaders like Deruti fiercely defended their independence. By definition, anarchists had to oppose organized militarism. They would defend the Republic against the fascists, but not at the expense of surrendering to any sort of authority, otherwise they could hardly be anarchists. In any case, defending the Republic was not enough. After successfully resisting the army's coup in the cities, they now took the offensive. The war provided the opportunity to achieve a freedom and justice that they argued was impossible under bourgeois democracy. They claimed that war and revolution were inseparable. War had been imposed on us because we were being attacked and the revolution was to rebuild society according to our ideals. We weren't going to give our lives for capitalism. We were giving them for the revolution. This is how I felt about it and most of the others. Two hundred miles from the front, Barcelona was now anarchy itself. Governmental authority had gone. The anarchists were the only power, but since they opposed all authority, they logically refused to take power themselves. Instead, their leaders chose to share control of Catalonia in a committee of anti-fascist militias, while the rank and file made their revolution at the roots of society. Pues... The whole of the wood industry, for instance the factories, all the forests, were taken over by the Union. Those bosses who hadn't fled to France stayed in their homes because there'd been 17 or 18 murders among the bosses. The Union said, let's collectivize it all. And then there was a kind of takeover. 
and they created what was called socialized wood industry. The first thing that was done was something rather strange, but it was something the workers had never managed to get, and that was healthy working conditions in the workshops. 80 or 90 small workshops were closed because they didn't have enough lighting or ventilation or the machinery was unsafe. Big production units were created instead. Industry was collectivized. Women were liberated. Abortion was legalized. Barcelona celebrated its freedom. This was a revolution. It had a dark side too. The revolution found its enemies within. First, the church, a symbol of authority, the enemy of individuality, in Spain, a dreaded hierarchy. Thirteen bishops died in the revolution, and nearly 6,000 priests, nuns and monks. This appalled the religious in what was still nominally a Catholic country. It fueled nationalist propaganda against the godless republic. The tombs of nuns were sacked. That atrocity was common to both sides. The general's coup had let loose an orgy of reciprocal vengeance. For the nationalists, General Muller had set the tone from the beginning. He said, it is necessary to spread an atmosphere of terror. We have to create an impression of mastery. Anyone who is overtly or secretly a supporter of the popular front must be shot. The Spanish War had barely begun when the London Daily Express correspondent in Republic of Madrid was told by his colleague from the Times that victims of the terror could be found in the grounds of the university. Just outside the Faculty of Philosophy, I saw the first bodies. They were lying, some in pairs, some singly, scattered all over the wide expanse of the field. I counted altogether 18 all lying with their face to the sun and shot through the head. As a journalist, I naturally wanted to find out what was going on. So I went to see the head of the Communist Commission of Investigation. In the vacuum of authority left by the uprising of revolution, the political parties had set up their own so-called investigation committees. In the absence of official bodies of law and order, their function was not just investigation, but the brutal administration of justice. Madrid and Barcelona and the other cities were left virtually without any police whatsoever. At the same time, during the first riotous days of the revolution, the prisons had been thrown open, the warders had walked out, and hundreds, if not thousands, of, well, of criminals had gained the liberty. You had political factions out to kill as many fascists as possible, even the communists rivaling with the anarchists to see who could get the biggest score. You had also these common criminals out to, in many cases, to avenge old grievances. For example, there were cases of uh, criminals who had been sentenced by a judge seeking out the judge and shooting him. And you had other people who maybe owed money to a tradesman, couldn't pay it, and. Uh, they knew full well that they only had to shoot that tradesman during the night and he would, they would not be called to account. The random terror of Republican Spain was matched in the nationalist zone. 
but here their methods were systematic and justified as a crusade to purify Spain. A lawyer called Francisco Payatas Lopez escaped from Republican Madrid to the nationalist zone. He saw the crimes of both. No ha pasado en una zona nada que no haya pasado en la otra. Nothing happened in one zone that didn't in the other. Nobody committed a crime which the other side didn't also perpetrate. The big difference was that in the red zone it was popular fervor which spilled over and killed people. On the other side it was those in authority who coldly condemned people to injustice. The moral difference is striking because it's one thing for an ignorant populace to do something spontaneously. Another thing for people in authority to carry something out coldly, bloodily, talking about a holy crusade in God's name, which is blasphemy, because God cannot condone anything like that. As far as anyone knows, God was not consulted. Nobody seemed to mind. At the beginning, outside Valladolid, 40 Republican prisoners were shot every dawn. It became spectator sport. An opportunist vendor set up a snack bar. The nationalist authorities rationalized their brutalities by the obligation to purge the motherland of alien ideologies, atheistic, masonic, Marxist, or for that matter, liberal. Hamas never shrieked the propaganda. Nor was this modern inquisition concerned only with politics. Federico García Lorca was the avant-garde of an artistic renaissance. Conservatives thought that his themes Sexual freedom, justice and compassion undermine the moral fabric of Spain. Se le vio caminando entre fusiles por una calle larga, salir a campo frío aún con estrellas de la madrugada. Mataron a Federico cuando la luz asomaba. Lorca died in his hometown, Granada, where, out of a population of 150,000, there were more than four and a half thousand deaths. Dozens of the town's leading intellectuals were shot at the cemetery wall. Lorca was not a revolutionary, or even a politician. His death, like so many of them, was meaningless. Three days after the uprising, Lorca had fled his family home for the supposed safety of a nationalist friend's house. Two weeks later, he was arrested and without trial or sentence, sent by the authorities to his death. The last sight of Lorca was with a truckload of other victims on the road to their anonymous execution in the hills outside Granada. No one knows who pulled the trigger. It's believed that Lorca now lies beneath this olive tree in an unmarked grave. The nationalist terror was ferocious and from their point of view necessary. There was stalemate across the mountains north of Madrid. So the nationalist strategy to capture it now involved the army of Africa sweeping from the south across vast areas of Republican Spain. The working class population was hostile they had to be cowed. From his base in Seville, General Capo de Llano roared nightly threats to what over the radio he called the Republican rabble. On the 25th of July, he announced, let it be known, for every right-wing person killed in the villages, I should kill ten, and perhaps exceed this proportion. This was to prove no idle threat. In Laura del Rio, the Andalusian village where the revolution had brought the people meet for the first time and local right-wingers had been arrested, time was catching up. The civil war's justice of vengeance was underway. Further down the valley, nationalist troops were advancing. In village to village, anyone who resisted was summarily shot. <laughs> The nationalist troops had left Seville for the villages, and wherever they went, they just cleaned the place up. 
They dealt with anybody they wanted to. This one, boom, dead. I know about you, Paco. Bang. No procedures were followed. A simple accusation was enough. The threatening advance created panic in Laura del Rio. The village prison records show that as the nationalist troops advanced, all the right-wingers who had been locked up were taken out and handed over to the Revolutionary Committee. Entregado al Comité. The same names on the graveyard memorial show what those words meant. Anyone delivered to the Committee for Justice was shot. When the Nationalists took the village, the killing began again. The prison records for the following weeks tell the other side of the war's history of reciprocal revenge. I didn't see anything. No, I heard it. It was such a scandal. I heard the trucks pass and the shots and more trucks and more shots. They swept them all away. I lived on that street, along by the railway line. You can see that the cemetery is very near. It's there where those trees are. So we could hear, especially in the silence of the night. When we heard the trucks passing at 3 a.m., we knew what it was. Rojo means red. To the nationalists, all opponents were red. And if captured, shot. Local landowners in Andalusia joined the nationalist columns. We had risen against something we considered disastrous for the country, because they were killing our relatives, attacking our farms. For me, it meant the liberation of our country. For me, it was the war against communism. In my heart, I was anti-communist. You see, it wasn't against the Republic as such. It was a question of communism or not. In this country, there was a red revolution. As an individual, a worker may be good, bad or indifferent, the same as a boss, the same as a businessman, the same as anybody, and yet collectively they're terrible. The workers as an entity will always be selfish. They have never considered the country's well-being as a whole. That sort of hatred is past reason or compromise. Moreno de la Cova and other landowners joined the columns making their way through Andalusia to avenge their murdered families, reclaim their lands snatched by the revolution, to execute the Red Resistance. While the nationalist columns were wiping up opposition in the rear, the Army of Africa, Franco's Moors, marched along the road to Madrid. They took Merida in the first proper battle of the war. This linked them with the nationalists in the north. Ahead lay Madrid, but the frontier town of Badajoz, where the garrison, loyal to the Republic, was cut off. The battle for Badajoz was ferocious. The Army of Africa, the Moors and the Foreign Legion won a bloody victory at great cost of life. First on the scene after the battle, was Portuguese journalist Mario Neves. It was terrible. The Moors were capable of anything. I suppose they were excited since they had come all the way from Morocco, had flown over the Strait of Seville and had fought violent battles on the way to Badajoz. An officer warned us not to speak to the legionnaires because they were so violent. A column of some 120 men in a state of total madness arrived at these walls and advanced only to be crushed by gunfire.
once the legionnaires had breached the defences, they went berserk. Nevich followed their rampage. Forty-five years later, he returned for the first time. People were trying to escape, and they usually tied a white handkerchief round their left arm. But the rebels, who were looking for fighters, pulled their shirts, or rather tore them away violently, to find the mark left by the gun. As they had been fighting a lot, the gun left a black mark, and this was enough for them to be immediately arrested and to endure the fate we all can guess. They herded them into the bullring. No trials, of course. No inquiry. No questions. Just the swift bullet. I wanted to go to the bullring where people had told me there were several prisoners and piles of bodies. On my way there, I saw a brook where heaps of bodies lay. There were heaps of them. They were in several dramatic postures, which caused an extraordinary impression. I tried to get into the bullring, and I succeeded. I talked to the guards and noticed that there were now just two bodies left in the middle of the ring, but I realized then that there were still several prisoners in the bullpens. But I was so disturbed, I did not want to talk to them. They were obviously awaiting their final moment. It was said that more than 2,000 people were summarily shot by a firing squad. Mario Neves got over his nausea and became a reporter again. I immediately tried to find out who were the authorities in the town, who was in charge. It turned out to be Colonel Yagwe, and I told him that everybody was talking about the shootings with horror. He expressed a certain indifference, and I asked him whether shootings were taking place, and if so, how many. I added that I had heard that 2,000 people had been shot. He looked at me, hesitated, and replied, Probably not that many. But something in the way he said it left no doubts about the truth of the stories, which had already spread all over town. Three days later, Yagwe was interviewed by an American reporter. Yagwe had his own estimate of the killings. Do you think I was going to take 4,000 red prisoners, he said, while my column marched against the clock? Of course we shot them. Should I have left them free behind me to let Badahoth become a red town again? No one knows, even now, how many died in the Badahoth massacre. The nationalists allowed them no memorial. They took the prisoners from the bullring to the cemetery and disposed of the bodies. I could see a cloud of smoke hanging over the cemetery, over this corner of the cemetery. And the following day I came straight to the cemetery to find out what was happening. And it was then that I had the most Dante-esque vision of my life as a journalist. There were bodies of people who had been shot, piling up in one of the wings of the cemetery. They had been set on fire with petrol to be destroyed. I recall, as if it were today, the day I came here and left utterly distressed. And I was so distressed that a priest looked at me and, realizing I was so hurt and so sad, asked me what was wrong with me. I sighed and he shrugged. They deserved it. They deserved it, he said. This was my last sight of Badahoth in those first days after the town had been taken over. And I swore I would never come back here. But here I am to give my testimony, since I feel that I can no longer hide the sad memories I have of that time. The terror did not end with the battle. A month later, prisoners were still being executed in the bullring. To be a Republican in Badahoth was to ask for death. Such a one was the husband of Teresa Villalobos. He was the town photographer. 
I don't mind saying it, he was a Republican. When the Republic was declared, he was the first to put out the flag. He said, let's go back to Badajoz. He said, I don't think they'll detain me, even though I'm left wing. I certainly don't think they'll kill me or anything. So we came back and they caught him. Well, of course, they jailed him and I went to look for him. I said, what's up? He didn't do anything. He wasn't with the fighters or anything. That was wasted effort and they took him to the bullring. My father-in-law and I went to the bullring to see him. I went in and there was a window, but I couldn't go near him or he near me. But he stretched out his hand and I kissed it and he kissed mine. But I couldn't go near him to kiss his face. His face was like yellow wax. He had big blue eyes. His eyes were glued on me and his father and it was pitiful to see him. He said, Father, these are the worst moments of my life. Do what you can because they'll kill me. We went away because the guards said we couldn't talk anymore and had to wait till the morning. Then we went to the cemetery. It took several days for the terrible truth of the Badajoz massacre to reach the rest of Spain. In Madrid, the news coincided with the first air raids on the capital. Together they provoked a new wave of spontaneous vengeance against anyone suspected of nationalist sympathy. Prime targets were right-wing political prisoners in the city's Modelo jail. A fire broke out in the prison, either started by political prisoners trying to escape, or by common criminals egged on by the anarchist militias who had taken charge of one wing of the jail. However that may be, the consequence was tragic. A crowd gathered and herded the prisoners out of their cells. Socialists protested, but shootings began. They picked people out, took them outside and we could hear shots. It was like a scene from the French Revolution. There was a table with some candles tucked in bottles and they had a tribunal of men and women there dressed in overalls and wearing strange hats. Raimundo Fernández Cuesta was a member of the fascist party. Another prisoner was Ramón Serrano Suña, Deron Franco's brother-in-law. Another was Don Melquiades Alvarez, a former speaker of the Spanish parliament. They grabbed him and he turned round to us and said, to spend all my life defending the people, to end up in this way, to finish like this, and he said goodbye. A very short while afterwards, we heard shots from one of the cellars under the gallery itself. That's where they killed him and the others. In outrage at the atrocity, some European ambassadors threatened to recognize the army rebel government. Socialist leader Prieto said that night could lose them the war. Prime Minister Hiral wept. President Atania wished himself dead. The revolution had swept away formal courts, but the Medello tragedy made some system of justice imperative. New courts were set up. The rebels were allowed lawyers in what were called popular tribunals, and they began to curb the worst excesses of revolutionary justice. The absence of clear authority had also meant setbacks for the Republic at the front. Franco's army took Talavera, a step nearer Madrid. In the north, General Moller cut that branch of the Republic off from any chance of supply from France by capturing Irún. On the Aragon front, the Republican columns failed to take Taragotha. The revolution was underway in the rear guard, but at the front, the Republican militias were getting beaten. Enrique Lista, a commander of the 5th Regiment, was trained in Moscow. No eran eh, efectivas porque las milicias eh, no obedecían realmente. The militias were not effective because they didn't really obey the general staff. They took their lead from unions, from political parties. 
They were not effective militarily from the point of view of fighting a regular organized army, such as we were facing at the front. The other side had brought forces from Africa. They had some of the best military units at their disposal and regular units of foreign armies were starting to arrive. Later, of course, there were Italian troops and the German Condor Legion. We couldn't face up to them at the front with party or union militias which didn't obey orders, who, whenever they received an order, had to hold a general assembly to decide whether or not they would obey it. As the Republic's war effort flagged and failed, the Prime Minister Hiral resigned. Lago Caballero, the Socialist Trade Union leader, replaced him with a government which included communists for the first time. As Prime Minister and War Minister, Lago tried to bring the fragmentary and fragmented revolution under control and to centralize the war effort. In one instance, at least, it was too late. At Toledo, the Republican militias had besieged the local army rebels who had occupied the old Arab fort, the Alcata. The siege was a shambles. There was absolutely no discipline whatsoever in, in their attack. People would come out on Sundays, for example, and they were allowed ordinary people from Madrid out for the weekend, would drive in lorries or cars if they had them, and they took a pot shop at the Alcazar. They were very proud of being able to go back to Madrid and say they had done so. Prime Minister Lago Caballero was getting desperate. He tried to end the siege by having miners dynamite the rock on which the Alcata stood. It didn't work. Within 10 days, the garrison was relieved by Franco's efficient troops, and the Republicans retreated. Franco made a meal of the Alcata. It had delayed his attack on Madrid. But Toledo made him a hero. Within days, he became Generalissimo, Commander-in-Chief, and then Head of State in the Nationalist Zone. With Franco poised for a final offensive, Refugees fled Madrid. Less than four months after the start of the war, the government itself evacuated to Valencia. That left the usual vacuum of authority and a familiar pattern of atrocity. The militias in charge of the jails feared that prisoners would escape in the nationalist assault. They began to move them out in lorries along the road to Valencia, but the prisoners never arrived. The militias controlling the convoy made them stop at Paraquayas, 15 miles outside Madrid. There, more than 1,000 men, mainly captured rebel officers, were shot and dumped in mass graves. The executions continue for days. It cannot be doubted the authorities knew. Even the anarchist director of prisons protested, but nothing could stop the killing. The Spanish Civil War, like any other, unleashed the passions of centuries of hatred. There were humane protests and profound individual acts of mercy. But until the vacuum of authority in the Republican zone was filled and the systematic nationalist purge exhausted, the killing was unrestrained. And still the war was only four months old. And still the international brigades were on their way to Madrid. And that city's resistance would continue the war another two and a half years.
When I see the animals and the dead people in the picture, I remember that night when I went along the road to Guernica, after we left the air raid shelters. It was full of dead animals and people covered in sacks. Dead. I have always been filled with emotion to see that woman burning on the balcony with her arms outstretched. I think she could be my grandmother. Picasso's painting, Guernica. For two survivors, the town's bombing in the Spanish Civil War is a personal memory. But for nearly 50 years, it has echoed in the conscience of the world. Spain, in the 1930s, was in many ways still struggling out of the 19th century. But it found itself the arena and battlefield for ideologies of the 20th. Men and women from all over the world fought for dreams of democracy, or communism, or fascism. Those ideas were later given a bitter new meaning by the hindsight of global conflict and the Cold War. Europe in 1936. Hitler had been in power for three years. Mussolini had ruled Italy since 1922. In Russia, Stalin had begun the show trials and purges of his enemies. Democracy everywhere was on the defensive. Britain and France were fearful of a European war. Then came the news from Spain. <laughs> is turmoil in turbulent Spain, and the cost of political anarchy is death and destruction. This unhappy country, reft into two almost equal camps, illustrates all the tragedies of civil war under modern conditions. Innocent people lose their lives, property of law-abiding citizens is wrecked, and half the combatants fight half-heartedly for one cause or the other because they are forced to take sides. Such is the fruit of anarchy, of a people divided against itself. The newsreels, as usual, had a simple explanation anarchy. But in truth, Spain's crisis confused many an outsider. To understand it, they translated the peculiarly Spanish issues into their own. Spain became Europe's obsession. The idea of the Spanish liberalism and the Spanish workers, the Spanish people, um, seemed a, a, a very passionate and pure cause. Um, I remember that my Oxford tutor, who was a philosophy tutor, said there was the only course in his lifetime in which there seemed um, a complete choice, absolute choice, between good as represented by the Spanish Republic and evil as represented by the Francoist forces. The convictions of Europe's left were matched by their enemies on the right. Renzo Lodoli was an Italian fascist. Mi sembrava che in Spagna fosse necessario difendere I thought that in Spain it was necessary to defend Christianity. It was under siege. We thought that fascism was valid as a social and political doctrine. So it was our duty to go and help those who wanted more or less the same thing as we did. Immediately, both sides sought and found gestures of support from rival sponsors abroad. In the liberal democratic world, individual sympathy for the plight of the Spanish Republic was widespread, but practical help from governments was to prove a different matter. The army rebels' pleas, on the other hand, 
were soon answered. Franco was not, at that time at least, a fascist. He was a conservative monarchist, but he was immediately assisted by European dictators who were fascists, and so he was inevitably identified with their kind of political despotism. Nevertheless, there is no evidence of any international fascist complicity in the Spanish general's original coup. On the contrary, in the summer of 1936, Hitler's thoughts were far from Spain. He was building a war machine for his own purposes, expansion in the East, and the repression of his opponents inside Germany. Hitler promised Britain that Germany wouldn't get involved in Spain. It was the first example of double talk in the Civil War, saying one thing and doing the opposite. Hitler had already sent aid. Two days after the Spanish uprising, Franco had appealed to the Fuhrer for help. After considering the consequence of a communist-influenced government controlling the Strait of Gibraltar, Hitler decided to send not the few anti-aircraft guns and fighters that Franco had asked for, but a full squadron of Junkers transport planes to airlift the Spanish Army of Africa from Morocco. One thousand five hundred of these troops were transported to Seville to begin their fighting passage to Madrid. These crack troops of the Spanish army were to play a decisive role in the war. Hitler said later that Franco should erect a monument to the Junkers 52, the aircraft that Franco had to thank for his victory. Hitler might have congratulated himself too. His help was later rewarded with a constant supply of Spanish iron ore. This gave him a great advantage in his preparations for the world war that was to follow. But in 1936, most people still thought that war could be avoided. In 1936, Mussolini had not yet become Hitler's pawn. Indeed, many British hoped Italy could become an ally. But Mussolini's conquest of Abyssinia had already shown that he was preparing aggressive expansion. He wanted to turn the Mediterranean into what he called Mare Nostrum, our sea, another Italian lake. There was a natural challenge at the entrance to that lake. Throughout the 30s, Mussolini had dabbled with small-scale right-wing plots to subvert Spanish democracy. He had modestly financed the leader of Spain's fascist party, José Antonio, and allowed right-wing military groups to train on Italian soil. In 1934, in a written though informal agreement, Mussolini had promised to supply arms to Spanish monarchist conspirators should they overthrow the Republic. When the time came, after the uprising, he supplied 12 bombers, the first foreign military hardware to arrive in Spain's war. While Germany and Italy supported the army rebels, Leon Blum, the French Prime Minister of the recently elected Popular Front government, naturally identified with the Republican government of Spain. Leon Blum feared France's isolation. Still haunted by the terrible French losses in the 1914-18 war, and already flanked by two fascist powers, France certainly did not want to be trapped in a fascist triangle. Bloom went to London to discuss plans for a collective security treaty with the British. Before he went, he ordered that arms be sent to Spain. At this meeting with Anthony Eden, the British Foreign Secretary, Spain was not officially on the agenda, but Bloom discussed it anyway. On his return to Paris, he reported the conversation to Jules Mock, a member of his government. Blum told me of his talks with Eden. And the extraordinary non-European stance that both Eden and his colleagues were taking. 
He didn't tell Bloom we shouldn't get mixed up in it, that even if war broke out in Europe over Spain, England, who was distant from all that, would remain neutral. Therefore, since France could not count on support from England, it would be wise for her to adopt the same position as the English. And I think I can recall that Blum told me that that would be a cowardly position. In London, the British national government was worried. Conservative Prime Minister Baldwin and his ministers were concerned at all costs to avoid another world war and feared it could start in Spain. Alec Douglas Hume was then a backbencher. If um, um, country after country began to take part in the war, then nobody could see the end of it. And it could uh, end up in a big European conflict. Mussolini was careering around in the Mediterranean and making all sorts of trouble. Uh, Japan was restive. And of course, German realm was in full flood. And so we were very apprehensive about getting entangled in any other uh, situation. Britain's attitude didn't help the French Prime Minister Leon Blum. His plan for keeping European peace by protecting Spain was also in trouble at home. His policy of unrestricted military sales had threatened to split his government and might have precipitated serious civil unrest. He therefore reversed his original decision to send arms to Spain and devised another policy to save his face. On August 2nd, the French cabinet announced that they had decided to appeal urgently to interested governments for a pact of non-intervention. The British government, supported at this stage by its Labour opposition, responded eagerly. I think France and Britain felt exactly the same on this issue. We did not want to get embroiled. And Mr. Blum, Mr. Blum, um, thought of the policy of non-intervention, which wasn't a heroic policy at all. But nevertheless, it was a pragmatic policy. As France closed its borders, the Spanish Republic felt let down. Under international law, it was legally entitled to buy arms abroad. But non-intervention stopped that. No one had ever claimed heroic intention for the policy. It was a diplomatic stratagem, a framework in which everyone could safely pursue their individual ends. They would fight their battles without actually going to war. No one thought it could curtail hostilities in Spain, or even that it should. Spain provided a safety valve to siphon off the political passions of Europe at that time. Il suo agisce fascista si pensa alla violenza, alla dittatura. Nowadays, when you say fascist, you think of violence or dictatorship. But at that time, we youngsters didn't know anything else. We had been brought up and educated under fascism. We were convinced that it could be a valid formula to solve social problems. Not all Italians were so convinced. Giovanni Pesci had been brought up in France. His parents had fled there to escape Mussolini's Italy. The fight for the Spanish people was also a fight against Italian fascism. This was the reason I came voluntarily to fight in Spain. La Passinaria, whose real name was Dolores Ibaruri, was a communist member of the Spanish parliament. Her rhetoric rallied worldwide support for the Republic. Era venuta la Passinaria. La Passionaria had come to Paris to ask for support, for help from the French people and the French government. She finished her speech by saying, if Spain is defeated, the world will be flooded with blood. And so I, a young, very young, militant of the anti-fascist movement, said that I must also go to give my contribution. In Germany, communists have been the first target of Hitler's terror. 
And so when Hitler made clear his support for Franco, German communists knew which side they were on. I believe that for us German anti-fascists, it was more poignant than for anybody else. We had tangibly experienced Hitler. Thousands of German anti-fascists were already in prisons and concentration camps, and we immediately recognized the connection between Franco's intentions and those of Hitler. The politics of economic depression spilled over from the cities of Europe to a full-scale battlefield in Spain. It was mainly communists who travelled to do the fighting. Frank Deegan was an unemployed communist docker from Liverpool. I believed that if Hitler and Mussolini managed to help Franco to win, then this would be a defeat for the whole labour movement throughout the world. We thought, you know, the fascists of the world were ganging together, so a call went out uh, for volunteers who helped the Republican government. The call came from Moscow. The International Committee of Communist Leaders, a Comintern, organized an international column of volunteers. Stalin himself, however, had his doubts. He was wooing Britain and France as allies against the Nazi threat and didn't want them scared off by communist intervention in Spain. He held back from sending arms. He did send advisors, ambassadors, and food. When the first Russian ship arrived in Barcelona, initial rapture gave way to disappointment when the consignment turned out to be not the guns that the Republic wanted, but canned milk. The guns only came later. Meanwhile, the Italian foreign minister Giano met Hitler at Bertesgaden in Germany. They agreed that their aid to the Spanish army rebels had to be increased, partly to counter Russian aid, and partly because Hitler had now decided he wanted to go over to the attack against the democracies. What had previously been a reflex action, a decision to supply Spain on request, became a concrete policy, a joint front against communism. A few days after Ciano and Hitler's meeting, Mussolini was heard for the first time to refer to the Rome-Berlin axis. Events in Spain had drawn Italy and Germany closer together, a step down the path towards the Second World War. I hate war! America. The world was very different in 1936. America was not the fulcrum of the world's foreign policy decisions. Still in dogged isolation from Europe's affairs, Roosevelt ignored the Spanish conflict and allowed the Texas Oil Company to supply Franco with fuel. In London, the non-intervention powers examined allegations of Italian, German and Portuguese intervention. The committee was chaired by the British. No one wanted the charges to stick, and they didn't. Von Ribbentrop, the German ambassador, later joked, a more appropriate name for the organization would have been the Intervention Committee. Nowhere was this intervention clearer than in the battle for Madrid. Until October, the skies were dominated by the rebels, reinforced by German and Italian planes. The Spanish Republican Air Force was no match until Soviet planes arrived. Just before the Soviet aid arrived, I had seen a demonstration of women marching along the Gran Via, the principal street in Madrid, shaking their fists at the German and Italian planes and shouting, no passeran, they shall not pass. Two weeks later, there was another flight of planes over Madrid. This time they flew very low and dropped no bombs. Everyone looking up from the streets suddenly saw that they were no longer Germans or Italians, they were Russian planes. And the cry went up that ran right through the city, son nuestros, son nuestros, they're ours, they're ours. One day we were surprised to see some new machines in the sky, and we saw these small ones with snub noses. They flew around at a tremendous speed and shot down a nationalist plane occasionally. People began to get excited, started shouting, Long live Russia! They started to hug each other. Just 15 weeks after the start of the war, 
The Republic's capital, Madrid, was on the front line. The rest of the Republic lay behind. The army rebels held the territory north and west of the capital. Their land offensive began on November 7th. With only 25,000 men, the nationalists were attempting to capture a city of one million inhabitants. Franco had made ready lists of people to be arrested. Having met little resistance so far, he could not have anticipated the stubborn reaction of the Madrid people. No passeran. They shall not pass. Had become the slogan of Madrid, and indeed of all Republican Spain. The government on the Lago Caballero left the capital for the safety of Valencia. So did many of the population. For those who stayed, some preparation to defend the city had already been made. General Miaka, one of the army officers who stayed loyal to the Republic, led the defense junta in charge of the overall political and military control of Madrid. Miaka and his staff officers were joined by Communist Brigade Commander Enrique Lista. The population had been prepared politically to receive the enemy with boiling water, with oil, with anything that came to hand from their balconies and roofs. The defense of Madrid was more thanks to the people of Madrid than to the militias. Entonces esta gente se incorporó a la lucha, pero pero sin pasar por casa, salieron del comercio. People joined up at once. They didn't even bother to go home. They were given some hand grenades and a rifle, and with their ordinary jacket and trousers, they got into waiting vehicles or into a tram and went off to fight. This was really striking and wonderful. It was one of the most wonderful moments of the war. Everyone in Madrid was involved. Loyal officers staffed the army. Ordinary people built defenses for the city. Political parties recruited men for defense militias. But most of all, an organized army was created. However barely trained and equipped, ten new brigades of the popular army of regular soldiers mixed with volunteers, are naturally a more effective fighting force than the old militia columns. The people's resistance was stiffened by the approach of Franco's troops and by potent propaganda. Hoy con más calor le hierve, ya nunca podrá dormirse, porque si Madrid se duerme, querrá despertarse un día y el alba no vendrá a verle. No olvides Madrid la guerra, jamás olvides que enfrente los ojos del enemigo te echan miradas de muerte. Rondan por tu cielo halcones que precipitarse quieren sobre tus rojos tejados, tus calles. Wir in Fernen Vaterland geboren, kamen nicht als harten Herzen mit. For two generations, the Spanish Civil War has been remembered for the international brigades. This fighting force of 40,000 men was a unique expression of international solidarity. There were Frenchmen, Greeks, Poles, Italians, Americans, Canadians, Irish, Czechs, Australians, Swedes, Swiss. There were 2,000 British. 500 of them died. But the war was already four months old, and Madrid under siege by the time the first organized volunteers arrived in the city to take up positions at the front. One of the first battalions was predominantly German. It was named after Ernst Thälmann, 
the leader of the German Communist Party, was in a Nazi concentration camp at the time. They took us straight to their hearts. They knew why we'd come. They had one slogan for us all, long live Russia. They treated us as if we were Russians, but only slowly they got to realize we were Germans. So far, Madrid had been bombed by Germans, the Condor Legion, and now suddenly there were Germans on their side with a background of military service, a life of resistance to persecution that bred political discipline. These German communists were an example to the Spanish. For me, seeing them brought the joy of solidarity, the warmth. They left a profound impression on Also, they showed us the things we had to learn, what discipline is, what an army is. Until then, we'd been a militia, not a regular army. Not all Republicans were so happy about the volunteers. In Catalonia, some anarchists feared their revolution was being taken over by communists. They arrested a party of international brigaders arriving from France. But in Madrid, everyone was grateful for any relief from the enemy. The international brigaders were rushed up to the front to help their Spanish allies resist the rebel army attack. There was fighting in the Casa del Campo, a park on the western edge of the city. On November 15, 1936, the rebels finally broke through Madrid's defences at a point in the university campus overlooking the park. The international brigades held the line in the philosophy faculty, but two days later the rebels attacked again and occupied part of the clinical hospital. The Terran battalion found themselves defending one floor of the hospital from the moors on the floor below. We were on the third floor. We'd knock holes in the ceiling, and then we'd throw hand grenades down to clear them out. In this fight, there was hardly ever a real front, a front which was clearly defined. Eventually, the line stabilized, and Madrid held out. So Franco tried a new tactic. The civil war became a testing ground for modern weapons. It was a foretaste of what was to happen a few years later in London, Hamburg, Tokyo and Leningrad. But until now, no city in history had been so sorely tested.
scenes like this on newsreels all over the world confirmed the sympathy that attracted so many people to the Republic. Journalists like Ernest Hemingway went to report and became propagandists. The original complex Spanish causes of the war were distilled into the poetic certainties of right and wrong. Wogan Phillips, now the only communist in the British House of Lords, went to drive an ambulance. Stephen Spender, the English poet, went with him to look. We are obsessed by the feeling that this was the supreme cause of our time, a cause of poets and of writers, the cause of freedom, and that unless uh, the cause of anti-fascism was won, unless fascism was defeated, we wouldn't be able to exist as writers. Like so many British radicals, Spender at that time was a member of the Communist Party, but he represented the liberal wing of English intellectual thought. I think there was a later generation of John Cornford and Julian Bell who got killed in Spain, who felt that they wanted to submerge their uh, literature, their independence of mind as intellectuals, even their existence as intellectuals, which was, seemed subjective to them, within the objectivity of Marxism. This was the generation of Philby and Maclean. Philby was in Spain for a while, working as a Times correspondent with Franco's forces. In fact, he was spying for the Russians. Julian Bell had developed his Marxist ideas at Cambridge, in the same secret society, the Apostles, which included Antony Blunt. The threat of fascism had turned a generation of English intellectuals into communists. The brutal realities of Stalin's Soviet Union had not yet been made known. Some people, like George Orwell, however, who had gone enthusiastically to fight for the Spanish Republic, came to appreciate in Spain the danger of all-pervasive totalitarian communism. He joined the anti-Stalinist party, the Poom. The persecution of the Poom by the official communists disillusioned many who thought the Republic was a democracy. Most volunteers, though, were communists, and those who weren't felt isolated. I remember going to the... Uh, the, the, the front near Madrid once and meeting a young man there uh, who was an English public school boy and he said to me well you know I, I came to Spain and joined the international grade because I understood it to be a liberal uh, republican organization and what I found is that it's an ent entirely communist organization and then he said I would spend the rest of my life every day walking up to that ridge that you can see a few hundred yards away and that'll be the end of me and he certainly was disillusioned although he accepted this and he did he was killed within six weeks but for many Spaniards the Soviet Union's support seemed a salvation in 1937 Teresa Pamias was a member of the socialist youth <laughs> The Soviet Union sold guns to the government of the legitimate republic. Guns came to Barcelona and their ships. It brought us this feeling of mythical togetherness, which became very solid. This comradely solidarity had a hard business edge. All the arms were paid for. Spanish gold reserves had been sent to the Soviet Union. They supplied the arms, political influence came with them. In Madrid, morale was sustained by showing epic Soviet films like Kronstadt, celebrating the defense of the Soviet revolution of 20 years earlier. But the Soviet influence was not revolutionary in Spanish terms. On the contrary, the Communist Party's disciplined approach to fighting the war and keeping order attracted large sections of the middle classes in the Republican zone. They had been frightened by the rival anarchist revolutionary ambition for the Republic. At the end of 1936, Stalin wrote to Largo Caballero and argued in diplomatic French that the Republic should collaborate with liberals and conservative peasants. It is necessary to prevent the enemies of Spain considering her a communist republic, he said. Stalin, remember, still needed Britain and France on his side. They were still not his certain allies against the threat of Hitler. And in Spain, Hitler's intentions were becoming clear. 
His ambassador formally recognized the Franco regime during the battle for Madrid, and now Hitler could hardly afford to let the rebels lose. Germany increased its aid and sent instructors to train nationalist officers. This gave Franco's rebels a useful but still not decisive advantage. The nationalists were holding about 60% of Spain, but they were short of troops and had stalled on a front of 1,200 miles. In spite of a dangerous bulge run Madrid, the Republic was holding its ground. The nationalist sponsors became impatient, particularly Mussolini. Without even consulting Franco, he began to send large numbers of Italian volunteers to Spain. The first battle was at Malaga. It was an easy victory. It shortened the front and raised nationalist morale. The nationalists now tried to encircle Madrid, first from the south by crossing the Jarama Valley. Republican reinforcements, including international brigaders, were rushed up to the front line. After ten days, the battle had spent itself, with heavy losses on both sides. There immediately followed another attempt to encircle Madrid, this time from the north of Guadalajara. The Italians, supremely confident after their victory at Malaga, persuaded Franco to let them fight alone. On the Republican side, the Italians from the Garibaldi Battalion of the International Brigades took up position against their fellow countrymen. This was the position of the Battalion Garibaldi. This was the position of the Garibaldi Battalion. Headquarters was near the woods. The fascists were here, here, all in this area. Then, at about noon, we saw two cars go by. We stopped them and they said to us, but we are Italians. We answered, we're Italians too. Giovanni Pesci and his comrades had found just what they had come to Spain for the opportunity to fight Italian fascists. They started to raise their hands, very worried, and began to cry, don't shoot us, we are Italians too. It's not our fault if Mussolini sent us here. They told us they were sending us to Abyssinia. We took them prisoner and took them to the command. When the Republican troops routed the Italian opposition, Mussolini was furious. He decided that no Italian could return home until they'd won a victory. Foreign aid on both sides poured into Spain at a faster rate than ever before. But it was not enough to clinch the war, only to prolong it. And Madrid was now a stalemate. It remained so until the end of the war, two years later. So the nationalists switched their offensive to the north. The western part of the Basque country was still Republican. It had been separated from the main Republican zone since the early days of the war. This northern region was a potentially valuable prize on account of its heavy industry and mineral wealth. It was a special region in other ways. Here, conservatives were fighting side by side with anarchists and socialists. The Basque gave the lie to Franco's claim that his campaign was a Christian crusade. The region is the most devout Catholic area in the country. Here, people prayed for victory against the nationalists. Their opposition to Franco and support for the Republic came from the traditional Basque yearning for the home rule of their region, so distinctive from the rest of Spain. The Liberal Republic recognized that ambition, but the nationalists who believed in the unity of Spain were determined to crush it. The attack began on March 31st, the nationalist, General Moller, threatened to raise the region to the ground. He nearly succeeded. But first, the nationalists tried to starve the Basque into submission. A sea blockade of Republican ports posed an embarrassing problem for Britain. Several British merchant ships, legally commissioned to deliver food supplies to the Republic, were stuck in the French port of Saint-Jean-de-Luz. The British government was reluctant to challenge Franco's navy by supplying escorts for their merchantmen, despite outcry from the House of Commons, 
Eden announced that British ships would be protected only outside a three-mile limit of Bilbao. At the same time, the British were secretly negotiating with the Nationalists for the output of British-owned mines in Spain. On April 19, 1937, a Captain Roberts, the master of one of those ships, the Seven Seas Spray, became anxious to leave saint jean de luz before his cargo rotted. Captain Roberts defied the British order and set sail for Bilbao. His daughter, Fifi, was on board. So at 10 o'clock we darkened ship and pulled up anchor and uh, sailed out. Frantic flashings from the shore and a searchlight was played on us, but um, Father was doing a Nelson act, you see, and he, he just shut that eye and we sailed on. I mean, there's nothing to it. In spite of the warnings of the British government and the threats that Bilbao Harbour had been mined by the Nationalists, the Seven Seas Spray arrived unscathed and sailed up Bilbao River. We were the first in and were told there's only four days' food left for the people. Everybody was cheering, hooters were going. It was rather like a ticker tape reception. Only we were coming up the river and everybody was hanging out from all the windows and waving and cheering. It's quite emotional. Captain Roberts and Fifi became the Basque people's heroes. The Seven Seas Spray had exposed the nationalist blockade as a myth, and other British merchant ships followed with food supplies. But the Basque couldn't celebrate for long. Ten miles behind the front line was the small market town of Galica, with a population of 7,000. It was the historic centre of Basque nationalism. The tree of Galica, the symbol of Basque freedom, stood beside the parliament building where traditionally all Spanish monarchs had sworn to uphold Basque liberties. April 26th, 1937, was market day. <laughs> The market was held where the public gardens of Guernica are now. Everything was normal, but then the planes came in the afternoon. Donia Ignatia Othomith lived in Guernica with her two daughters, Coni and Manoli. We were in the industrial zone, and over the hills opposite, I saw the planes arriving. First, just one of them. It circled twice, but we were used to seeing it do that and fly away again. But scarcely 10 or 15 minutes later, more arrived, and we were able to count them. There were eight, all in a line, black. I remember them as very black and ugly. I'll never forget the noise the bombs made. A kind of fizz. Followed by cries. Then a tremendous crash, over and over again. I can still hear the noises. And we could feel everything tremble. Smoke and heat came in. 43 aircraft, mainly German, took part in wave after wave of attacks on the small town. Carl von Canal was a squadron leader of the Condor Legion, which bombed Genica. This had no impact on me. I conducted these attacks and operations in the course of my duties as a soldier, carrying out my orders without heed for my life. At the time, we thought we were fighting a war against communism. The Condor Legion might have believed the Catholic Bars were communists, but the Spanish High Command who ordered the attack knew otherwise. For both of them, Genica's cultural significance was more or less irrelevant. It was a military target. There was a small arms factory. A Republican soldier retreating from the nationalist attack had to pass through the town to reach the last line of defence round Bilbao. The Germans claimed their instructions were to bomb the bridge and crossroads at the edge of Genica in order to make the road to Bilbao impassable. 
In three hours, 100,000 piles of incendiary, high explosive and shrapnel bombs were dropped on the town. Little remained standing, except the arms factory and the Germans' main target, the bridge. We could clearly see that the wind blew the bombs onto the fields. They missed the bridge and the houses by it. The Junkers were really commercial airplanes converted into bombers. That is, they were equipped with what we called a pot slung underneath the plane. It could be retracted during takeoff and landing and lowered during flight. And the poor observer had to climb down a tiny ladder into this contraption with his goggles and his flying helmet on. And there he had a primitive targeting device and rangefinder. The Germans' excuses don't explain why they did not use accurate Stuka dive bombers to destroy their objective, the bridge at the edge of Gunica. Nor the fact that they machine gunned the fleeing population. Nor the magnitude of the whole operation. I can still remember, and I was just nine years old, the force of the blast of heat in my face as I came out. All the buildings next to the factories were burning, everything on fire. The sky was red with reflections. Two days after the bombing, Fifi Roberts was taken with her father to see the devastation of the town. Forty-five years later, she returned to Ganika to revisit the scene she had photographed with her own camera. Along the road, there were streams of refugees trudging along. I don't think they had any idea where they were going, what they were going to do. They were on carts, wheelbarrows, anything that had a wheel that was being pushed and a few of their belongings on it. It's rather heartbreaking to see. And then when we got into Ganika itself, uh, there wasn't a building standing. There was rubble all over the place. Nobody to be seen except the odd soldier. I think they'd be still looking in the ruins for, for bodies. Uh, luckily, we didn't see any. But the place was an absolute shambles. 72 hours after the raid, before the reckoning of destruction could be completed, the rebel army arrived at Benica. They immediately began a propaganda offensive as well, making show of guarding the famous Bass Tree of Liberty. They even tried to put the blame on the Bass for destroying their own town. Some people were even prepared to believe this. The nationalists' real prize lay ahead. To protect their rich industries, the Baas had built a defensive wall around Bilbao, a ring of iron. But it could not protect the city from intensive bombing. With Bilbao about to fall, the Western democracies finally felt free to help. The children of Republican Spain were catalogued, given medical inspections, labelled and transported to England, France, Belgium, America and the Soviet Union. Franco soon broke through Bilbao's defences and seized the region's industries and mines intact. Soon ships left Bilbao with new cargoes. Soon Franco was exporting iron ore. His clients included Germany and Britain. 
Both countries were to use the captured resources of the Republic for their own rearmament program. Non-intervention, either real or phony, didn't interfere much with business or prevent the world war that was to follow. It was an extraordinary Barcelona. Everything had changed. You couldn't tell Barcelona was at war, but you could tell there was a revolution going on. And there were far more flags and many people in the streets calling for volunteers, and many lorries leaving for the front, and many songs. There had never been so much singing. people of Barcelona celebrated. Within days of the army rising, revolution had burst out spontaneously in most of Republican Spain. The Republican government was hopeless. Later, government and revolution would come into confrontation, a confrontation that would help to seal the fate of the Republic. Madrid and other Republican cities, columns of workers' militia set out to fight the army rebels. In these first weeks of the Civil War, the militias were the only real defense of the Republic. They were young, enthusiastic, recklessly confident, but the columns had been thrown together in haste. Worse, each column was linked to one of the different parties or trade unions. There was no coordination, no central command. At first, socialist and communist, anarchists and moderate republicans marched together. Later, their deep disagreements about war and revolution were to threaten the fighting power and the very existence of the republic. But now in July 1936, the ecstasy and hope of revolution dominated men and women. Everything had changed. Even in the building, the matadors put away their brilliant uniforms and in street clothes raised the clenched fist.
Catalonia was the anarchist stronghold. Here the revolution was more profound, more extreme. By the end of July, anarchists who had seized weapons to defeat the rising dominated the city of Barcelona. It was a moment anarchist militants like Josep Costa had been waiting for. Però en aquells moments, quan se produeix el trencament, quan se, la societat es rebenta, At that moment, when society burst wide open, there was such tremendous enthusiasm among the working class, and this was channeled through the unions, the parties, everywhere. People participated with such enthusiasm, with such vitality, that it's very difficult to describe it now after so many years and to examine that situation coldly. But I do have to say that among ourselves, many of us said, Now's the time to destroy all that has been oppressing us. The Catalan government ruled only in name. All structures of power collapsed. Churches and monasteries were burned and looted. Helpless, the Catalan government offered power to the anarchists. But true to their principles, they refused it. The anarchists believed that out of this revolutionary explosion, the people would create their own free society without state, church or capitalism. Federico Monsegne was a famous anarchist orator. Had we taken power because we were the majority, it would have meant betraying a pact of common struggle we had, in a way, sealed with the blood of so many of our men from many different sides. Communists, socialists, syndicalists, and above all, anarchists. Communists, socialists, syndicalists, rabasayes, and above all, anarchists. It would have meant betraying that pact and doing in Catalonia what Lenin and Trotsky had done in the Soviet Union with the takeover of power by the Bolsheviks. We didn't do it, and we have been criticized many times for it. With hindsight, who knows? Perhaps, perhaps we should have done it. Some anarchists now feel that their refusal to take power was the beginning of their undoing. At that time, the anarchists had no doubt about their main objective, to defeat fascism. But for them, the campaign was not just against the army rebels, but against capitalism itself. While the columns surged out to defeat the enemy, committees of workers in the town struggled to construct a new order out of the confusion. At that time, it seemed impossible to solve those initial difficulties, but looking back, people really showed a lot of common sense. Everything was improvised. You could call it a miracle, despite the religious meaning of the word. It was a miracle achieved by the ordinary people. As the chaos subsided, this new revolutionary society began to function. Much of the Catalan economy was now being run by the workers themselves. In Barcelona, trams and cinemas, factories, Department stores and even greyhound tracks were run by their own employees. The trade unions sought a food supplies. Union lorries drove out to the villages with goods to exchange for food. Barter, not purchasing, kept Barcelona fed for the first weeks of the Civil War. In some places, Money itself, seen by anarchists as inherently evil, was abolished. Shopping was done with vouchers, issued by local committees. What do these vouchers represent? Well, they had to represent hours of production, the hours spent by a carpenter building a piece of furniture, or the hours spent by a peasant harvesting, working on the fields. Everything was calculated in hours of production. The peasants liked it because it meant making them equal to the industrial workers, making all work equal. Vouchers bought bread at the baker's. 
but they now also bought lunch at the Barcelona Ritz. The big hotels have been turned into hospitals. Or into canteens serving cheap meals to militiamen and working class families, as this anarchist newsreel proclaimed. grandes cocinas se prepara la comida para cuantos van al hotel a saciar su apetito. Los amplios comedores que antes ocupaban maquilladas y frívolas damiselas, grandes financieros, capitanes de industria, aristócratas ociosos y aventureros internacionales de toda la haya, ahora están abarrotados de hombres y mujeres humildes que siguen el ritmo de la sociedad que se está creando. Barcelona trabaja y come. Esa es su fuerza y su virtud. Now that the factories and workplaces were in the hands of the workers, Anarchist union leaders like Josep Costa fought to start production again. We told the workers to get back to the factory and wait for our instructions. Immediately we called all the factory owners and executives to a meeting at the town hall. We tell them, well gentlemen, something big has happened here. I don't know what's going to happen, but the factories have to continue functioning. We ask you to be at work again tomorrow at whatever hour you're supposed to start. Five o'clock or eight o'clock. Agreed? Agreed. But we have to warn you, labor relations will be very different from now on. The CNT, the anarchist trade union, had been taken by surprise when the revolution began. It was anarchist militants who rallied the workers to take over their industries. Where the old bosses remain, they had to take orders from these workers' committees. Nearly 2,000 enterprises were collectivized in Catalonia, the greatest experiment in workers' self-management Western Europe has ever seen. The workers now set about improving their working conditions. Free medical care and adequate pensions were introduced. But at the same time, some of the old employers were hounded as enemies of the people. Six days after it started, around July the 25th, 10 or 11 industrialists were killed in Terrassa. They were murdered. The Catalan bourgeoisie was seized by this general panic. Everybody thought his head was going to be chopped off any minute. I told my father that we should leave. We still had time to leave because everything was so chaotic. But he said, if God wants me to be killed, they can kill me. But I'm staying. Revolutionary terror spread through the Republican areas. The middle classes in most of Spain had supported the army rebellion. But the liberal Catalan middle classes had remained largely pro-Republican. Now they became the victims of this terror and turned against the Republic. I didn't belong to this side. I wasn't an anarchist. I wasn't a communist. I was a liberal man who respected other people's way of thinking. And on the other hand, I could never have fought on Franco's side, which was, and still is, totally opposed to my way of thinking. For the moderate Republican government, the revolution was threatening to split society. It also threatened its chances of winning the war. The Spanish communists took the same view. But it was not only the killings and the collectives that shocked the middle class. The revolution had destroyed a traditional way of life. The power of the church and its moral code disintegrated. For many women on the Republican side, it was a time of astonishing liberation. That revolutionary explosion gave us women absolute freedom. 
We couldn't live war as men were living it. For men, things hadn't changed all that much. Our lives, however, had really changed. Women took men's places not only in factories, not only as a workforce, not only in the war industry. It was all women. At that time, to be a woman and to be young was the ultimate. The revolution brought women instant and radical changes. Abortion was soon made available on demand. Initially, women went to the front to fight and die in the trenches. For Spanish feminists, prostitution was a relic of capitalist exploitation to be abolished. They set up schools to re-educate prostitutes. Revolutionary vice squads cleaned up the red light district of Barcelona. But it wasn't easy to change old habits overnight. At the Union there were arguments. We've heard that you shut the brothels. Where will people go now? The others would reply, they can find a girlfriend or get married. That can't be done overnight, they'd say. You could have shut two brothels today, another two tomorrow, so that people could get used to the idea. The same with the tavern. What about the waiters? What will they do for a living? Teach them another trade. Where? You see, there were those we called the pragmatists, the realists who could see the revolution wasn't easy. But then there were the moralists, those who gave the Spanish revolution the healthy air it had. Anarchists disapproved of marriage, believing that couples should unite or part freely without any license from church or state. Young revolutionaries happily adopted their advice, but many mothers were appalled by free love. Some mothers even came to the Union to speak with people they considered apostles of free love. Look, my daughter has left home without telling me. She's living somewhere with, with someone. We'd say, we're all in favor of it. Yes, but that boy will leave, and we don't even know his name. Well, anyway, the Union decided this had to be legalized somehow. So they invented what they called revolutionary weddings. Revolutionaries. Revolutionary weddings took many different forms. This is what happened in the Barcelona Woodworkers' Union. We made three copies of the marriage certificate, the original and two more. The union kept the original, and one copy each was given to the man and the woman, who were told, if at any time you have any problems and wish to separate, come here with both pieces of paper. We take our copy and set fire to the three of them, and you'll be free again. That was the official wedding ceremony. But as with many other things, it became necessary to force the situation a bit, because there wasn't enough time for persuasion and proper education. So the president of the union, a very amusing man from Seville, would take the man aside after the ceremony and tell him, look, what we said about burning the documents isn't quite as easy as you think. It's something that has to be thought about carefully and properly weighed up. So don't come here pestering me, because if you do, I'll give you such a kick in the balls. You'll remember it for the rest of your days, right? So off you go, be happy, long live the revolution. These revolutionary changes were taking place throughout Republican Spain. Led by improvised military commanders like Buenaventura Duruti, the militia columns pushed their way towards the front. Young laborers rushed to join the militia. As the columns advanced, they spread the revolution. The ancient dream.
dream of a collective society without profit or property was made reality in the villages of Aragon. In many places, money itself was abolished. All forms of production were owned by the community, run by their workers. These collectives formed an independent anarchist area within the Republic. The Council of Aragon coordinated their activities. Mas de las Matas was one of the many Aragonese villages collectivized in the summer of 1936. For the villagers, the experience has now become a well-remembered legend. These three men were among the young local anarchists who abolished private property in Mas de las Matas. Benigno Castanier was a carpenter. We built a sufficiently large workshop on the outskirts of the village and all the carpenters went to work there. They appointed a delegate to represent them at the collectivization committee. The same was done for the bricklayers, the barbers, the blacksmiths, for every trade, the tailors also. Well, all the barbers had joined the collective voluntarily. They were all in it voluntarily, weren't they? A large shop was found for them, and the three or four barbers in the village all brought along their tools and their chairs, and they all worked there for free. <laughs> and most of their work was done when the peasants came back from the fields in the evening. This also caused some problems, because some people would say, look at those lazy barbers, they spend the whole day walking around doing nothing. So we had to explain to everybody that they worked until 10 p.m. so that everybody could be served. Some people just didn't realize how late the barbers had to work. Well, this is one of those minor inconveniences. The anarchists forced all known right-wingers in the village to join the collective as well. The upheaval of revolution led to terrorism and repression. In Aragon, as in Catalonia, armed gangs drove around killing the better off, the right-wingers, and the followers of the church. A mass de las matters. Although the local committee tried to prevent it, six right-wingers were murdered just outside the village. Here, the only people allowed to keep their property were those left-wingers who were not anarchists. For the rest, members of the collective by choice are out of fear. The old world of cash and property, rich and poor, now disappeared. Money was abolished and we created what we called the family card with all the members of the family and everything that wasn't produced here was allotted according to the numbers in each family. For example, sugar, rice, even meat, a hundred grams per person per day. And it was the same for everybody. There were no preferences. Everybody ate as much as they wanted of the local produce. So money for use in the village was completely abolished. The first problem was that because everything was free, coffee, tobacco, this was a problem. Everything was free, so everybody wanted to drink coffee, everybody wanted to smoke and so on. So this is something that had to be corrected and that's when we started rationing cigarettes. No, no, tobacco was Russian, but we never denied anybody his cigarettes. This was a contradiction for us because we were against all vices, and yet we were well aware that by handing out free cigarettes we encouraged people to smoke, but we couldn't deny them to anybody. For the anarchist peasants in Mas de las Matas and in other villages, collectivization brought instant benefits. The profit motive had disappeared. Everyone now worked only for the community. I joined the collective fully convinced, and I gave everything. At home they were nearly crying because I took everything to the collective. Our sheep, all our money, everything. And with such enthusiasm. And working as much as we did before because the harvest had been delayed. We worked day and night. In this summer of 1936, the revolution was triumphing in most of Republican Spain but it was already failing in its most basic task, to win the war. Everywhere the militias were being held or defeated by the advancing rebel armies. In this crisis, the Republic was divided. For some, the government and the communists, revolution must wait until the war was won. 
for the anarchists and many socialists, the only way to win the war was to defend and extend the revolution. This argument was soon to tear apart and transform the republic, unleashing a civil war within the civil war. In central and northern Spain, the army rebels were winning the war. General Franco soon became the absolute political and military ruler of the nationalist side as his regular soldiers captured town after town. The militia columns, brave but disorganized, had no unified command. The revolution had left the republican government helpless. And yet, initially, the new revolutionary leaders did not form a new central government or military command of their own. Two months after the start of the war, Franco's troops were approaching Madrid. Now, at last, with the republic on the brink of defeat, the politicians in Madrid took action. In September 1936, the Socialist Union leader Francisco Lago Caballero formed a so-called Government of Victory with Socialist and Communist ministers. A strong military command was formed. Further revolution was discouraged. The anarchist revolution still controlled much of Catalonia and Aragon, The anarchist leaders refused on principle to join the new central government. But this government of victory was going to centralize political decision-making and leave the anarchists out in the cold. The new Madrid government was a triumph for the rapidly expanding Communist Party. In line with Stalin's policy, they stood for an anti-fascist popular front, an alliance of left-wing and middle-class parties which would appear moderate and responsible enough to win support from Western democracies. They also wanted to check the revolution and impose their discipline. Aparecía claro que entrábamos en una guerra civil. It was clear that we were entering a civil war and that we were facing an organized enemy with an organized army and that we needed a real army ourselves. And the starting point for this army was the 5th Regiment. The discipline of the 5th Regiment was powerful propaganda for the communist approach to the war. The communists, helping to build a new popular army, believed in the values of obedience, rank, authority. Their old rivals, the anarchists, were anti-militarist, opposed on principle to hierarchical discipline. For them, war, like revolution, must be made through popular initiative. I have always believed that the day they started to militarize the people, the day that the spontaneous nature of popular combat was destroyed, we started to lose the war. And this is something the communists have always refused to accept. But all styles of war need weapons. And the Soviet Union soon became the only country prepared to supply them in large quantities. This in turn increased the influence of the Spanish communists. A minority party when the civil war began, they were now becoming the strongest political force in the Republic. Soviet military aid arrived just in time to help defend the Spanish capital. No pasaran, there shall not pass. By November, Franco's troops had encircled Madrid on three sides. When the final attack came, the people of Madrid fought shoulder to shoulder with loyal officers 
and with the Republican militias who had been retreating for the past four months. The attack on Madrid was beaten back. The defense of Madrid became a legend, and it gave the Republic fresh hope for victory. The anarchist military commander, Duruti, died in the battle for Madrid. His funeral in Barcelona became an immense anarchist show of faith. But the movement was already beginning to split under the pressure of its own internal contradictions. With the enemy at the gates of Madrid, the anarchist leaders had shelved their principles and joined the government. Four anarchists became ministers in the central government. Others had already joined the Catalan regional government. Their followers were shocked and confused. Moreover, in Catalonia, the anarchist heartland, anarchist collectivization was being checked. The regional government was asserting control of the industries which anarchists had collectivized. Josep Tarradeas was a Catalan finance councillor. I was the first councillor and finance councillor of the regional government, the Generalitat. Therefore, faced with the CNT's refusal to allow control over the collectivized industries, I ordered all the banks not to cash any checks or hand over money to them without my permission. So the workers found themselves in a difficult situation. They would run out of money and at the bank they would be told, no, I need the Generalitat's permission. So then they would come to us and we would say, no, unless you allow us to control the collective. As the anarchists weakened, the communists became stronger. The party attracted many who felt threatened by the revolution. Middle-class moderates who admired communist discipline at the front and order and restraint behind the lines. Revolutionary chaos still reigned in much of Republican Spain. This led to an overwhelming feeling of unease in the country. And as we were in favor of discipline and control, of laying down all the rules necessary for re-establishing the army, the police, the courts of justice, well, obviously, all these things were welcomed by the population. But the communist methods of recruitment attracted bitter criticism from other parties in the Republic. In contrast with the other parties, the Communist Party opened its doors unconditionally and without any controls to anybody who wanted to join. What they wanted was to build up their party by taking advantage of the very special circumstances in Spain at the time. So that's the way they did it. They were very smart about it. It was easy to grow that way. They made the soldier, sergeant, the sergeant lieutenant, and the professional man captain. They cultivated people's ambition so that they became unconditional supporters. They made sure that people who had no influence in their civilian lives became important in military terms. The communists had been forced to change their line. At first they had opposed the revolution as a threat to the republic. In March 1937, they admitted that significant revolutionary gains had been made, but any further changes would have to wait. The overriding aim must be to win the war. For the communists, this meant bringing home rule in Catalonia and the Basque country under central control. One source of friction between the central government and Catalonia was control over the war industry. The only cartridge factory in our zone was near to Lima. So my trip to Madrid was to ask the central government that because the factory was still in our hands, it should be brought to Catalonia, which was the only place where it could function properly. Taradez's visit to Madrid ended in failure. The government, wary of growing regional power, refused his request. So I left Madrid without the Toledo factory. A short while later I heard, as did all the other Spaniards, that Toledo had fallen into the hands of General Franco. They chose, in a way, to leave this factory in Franco's hands rather than have it in a place where it could have been useful. 
But these squabbles over regional rights were far less ominous than the collision between communists and their political rivals over the whole future of the Republic. At this meeting in March 1937, Jose Diaz, the Communist General Secretary, asked, Who are the enemies of the Republic? He answered himself, Fascists, Uncontrollables and Trotskyists. He was following Stalin's policy in the Soviet Union. There, the Uncontrollables, the Anarchists, had already been purged. The Spanish Civil War coincided with the height of Stalin's purges of his political rivals. Leon Trotsky had been exiled in 1929. Bolshevik veterans like Zinoviev and Kamen have also seen here in 1926 at a state funeral, were executed in 1936. Trotskyist was a label given to any independent Marxist who defied the instructions of Stalin and the Comintern in Moscow. Communists in Western Europe justified these purges. Trotsky was pilloried as a Nazi agent. Bill Bailey was an American communist fighting with the international brigades. We had heard that Joe Stalin was trying to keep the country secured and safe uh, and get rid of all the enemies that were trying to constantly tear down the Soviet Union. Therefore, he was conducting these type of purges, and we were led to believe that they were enemies of the people, enemies of the Russian people, consequently the enemies of the working class, every place. And later on, of course, it proved that he was wrong, that he was nothing but a paranoid, sick SOB in many cases. And these people that were purged came from the background of fighting for the the great ideals of socialism. They went through all the aches and pains and the terror to create this society, only to be taken out later as dogs and shot. The PUM was an independent Spanish Marxist party which loudly attacked Stalin's dictatorship. Following the Moscow line, the Spanish communists called the PUM Trotskyist, which it wasn't, and accused it of collaborating with fascism. Frank Deegan, was a Liverpool docker who had volunteered to fight in Spain. Well, we were informed by our political commissars that our troops who were on the Anarchist front, who were mainly composed of anarchist uh, divisions and uh, members of the PU, who were commonly known as Trotskyists, were fraternising with the enemy, even uh, playing football matches. By the 1st of May 1937, the political tension in Barcelona was so acute that the May Day Parade had to be cancelled. The anarchists and the PUM were still powerful in the city. The communists were impatient for a showdown, as was the central government, with the exception, of course, of the anarchist ministers. The conflict began here, at the Barcelona telephone exchange, which was still run by anarchists. One of the girls on duty that day was Enriqueta García Tavera. I was at the switchboard near the window. The anarchist guards were half asleep over their rifles. At about three o'clock, I looked out and saw three lorry loads of assault guards pull up outside. They jumped out and raced into the building. They started going up the stairs. I think most of the anarchist guards were on the first floor. Then I heard shots and I was even more frightened. The anarchists saw this as the all-out challenge they had been expecting. They raised barricades throughout the city. Shooting began in the streets. On the Aragon front, some anarchist units began to march back to Barcelona. The anarchist Juan Manuel Molina was defence under secretary in Catalonia. I phoned all the commanders of the divisions at the front and told them to stay put and secure their sectors, but everything was quiet. I told them everything was under control in Barcelona and that we had more than enough men here. On the Barcelona streets, the anarchists could have used their superior strength before the government reinforcements arrived. The truth is that in Barcelona we controlled the situation. I hadn't intervened yet. All the military barracks were in my hands. 
except for the Karl Marx barracks, and we had it surrounded by the people, just waiting for my orders to attack. The anarchist ministers rushed to Barcelona. One of them, Federica Monsegni, appealed to her followers over the radio. She argued that they could not afford a civil war behind the lines. I tried to make them understand that they couldn't go on fighting, that they had to lay down their weapons and end that fight, that the battlefronts would collapse and it would all end shamefully in front of the whole world. This appeal horrified the anarchist militants of the barricades. Their leaders, they thought, had betrayed them. To lay down their arms would mean the end of their revolution. At the barricades, you heard all the insults you can possibly imagine. Old militants were saying that the ministers had forgotten what it was like to be a worker, that the revolution had to be carried out of the barricades and not of the ministers, and they were going to shoot those ministers. There I heard all those threats from people who were disappointed, and they all remembered what had happened to the anarchists under the Bolsheviks in Russia. And they feared the same would happen here, as it did eventually, that they would be victims of the repression of the communists. The Republic brought in troops to put down the insurrection. Five days of fighting had left about 500 dead. The anarchist power and their revolutionary vision of the future now lay shattered. That's where we lost the war, the revolution and all the hopes that the Spanish people had placed in the transformation. That's where it all ended, in the May events. The May events also overthrew Largo Caballero, the socialist prime minister of the Republic. He had been too independent, too tolerant for communist taste. Now he was forced out of office and replaced by Juan Negrín, another socialist, but more authoritarian than Largo Caballero. With the anarchist revolution checked in Catalonia, the communists were now free to deal with their other rivals, the Pool, who had fought alongside the anarchists in the mere events of Barcelona. In June 1937, Pool was declared illegal and an order issued for the arrest of its leaders. The first to be taken was Andres Nin, the Pum's general secretary. Julian Gorkin, another member of the Pum executive, witnessed his arrest. Another party member, Adroer de Rodella, came up to my office to tell me that the police had come to arrest us and take Andres Nin away. I looked out of the balcony and saw Nin walking outside, quite casually, surrounded by policemen. I never would have thought that I would never see him again, and the terrible tragedy that was being prepared for the death of Andres Nin. Nin was never seen again. He was apparently taken to this prison in Alcalá de Henares and later murdered by Stalin's agents. Other Pum leaders were later put on trial for treason. The price for halting revolution and restoring order to the Republic was high. Random terror was over, but the communists now controlled much of the political police. This nationalist propaganda film, made at the end of the war, allegedly shows communist torture cells in a Barcelona monastery. Freezing in refrigerators and disorientation techniques were used not only against Franco's agents, but also on the Republic's enemies within its own camp. Aragon was the last area still under anarchist control. In August 1937, the communist military commander Enrique Lista marched in to restore the central government's authority. The communist troops returned land to all those who had been forced to join the anarchist collectives. The central government, with communist support, 
had demolished the anarchist revolution and imposed its discipline. But at the front, the Republic was failing. Its new disciplined popular army continued to be defeated. Shortly after its takeover of Aragon, the Republican army launched another offensive in an attempt to take pressure off the north. The first major battle was at the small town of Belchite. As so often happened, many Republican soldiers gave their lives to capture a town which was strategically unimportant. It was a battle that American volunteer Bill Bailey will never forget. What happened was that the fascists were so deeply entrenched that they made every single foot here at a costly expense to us. They were dead, our dead was every place. Every street had men laying dead on it. Uh, getting inside a house, getting them out of a house, the only way we could do it was punch a hole through the wall, throw a few hand grenades in there, blow that place up, punch the hole again, making, making it bigger, then go into the house, and by God, we did this hour after hour after hour, until finally, we were able to take one entire street. And uh, it was just, uh, you figure that on both sides, the, the, our men were doing it on that side, we're doing it on this side, we're taking the floor, we're getting into the basement, and we're, they're resisting every single place. So finally, after say four or five hours, we were able to take one whole street, and that was at a very expensive cost. Belchite finally fell. But only months later, the Nationalists recaptured it, at very little cost. The Aragon offensive failed. The Republican army was weak on military tactics and had been torn by internal disunity. By the end of 1937, the Republic, its territory shrinking under Franco's onslaught, mounted another offensive. This time, the objective was the provincial capital of Teruel. In the bitter cold of the Aragonese winter, Teruel was conquered. Again, the Republic had won a bloody victory for an objective of little significance. These victory celebrations in Barcelona were premature. But the brave words of Catalan President Luis Campanch could no longer boost Republican morale. In January 1938, Franco's troops counterattacked and reconquered Teruel. Again, an initial Republican success had ended in disaster. The nationalist forces now prepared to push down from Aragon to the Mediterranean. As the Republican troops retreated, thousands of refugees streamed into Catalonia. The revolutionary battle cries now fell on deaf ears. Only young militants like Teresa Pamias kept their faith in a republican victory. 
Nosaltres teníem una actitud tan entusiasta i tan romàntica que no veiem We had such an enthusiastic and romantic attitude that we didn't even notice how ridiculous we looked when we climbed up lampposts to harangue all those poor women and many children queuing up to buy a bit of bread. We would shout from the lampposts that the fascists would not pass, that we would win the war and all lead better and happier lives. This may sound like demagoguery now, but at that time we really felt it. By February 1938, the nationalist troops were marching towards the sea. The offensive threatened Catalonia, the revolutionary heartland. But there as in the rest of Republican Spain, the revolutionary spirit of 1936 was now only a memory. On April 14, 1938, nationalist troops reached the Mediterranean and the Republic was cut in two. As Franco's troops celebrated, the Republic summoned up its remaining energies for a battle to prevent its final collapse. The River Ebro was where the Spanish Republic's fate was to be sealed. July 28, 1938. In the Ebro Valley, the Republic, now close to desperation, launched its greatest offensive. Much of the Republican army was thrown into the battle, a fight not just for ground, but supremely for time. Juan Negrín, the Prime Minister, knew that European war against Hitler was now close. If only the Republic could hang on, it might be rescued by the anti-fascist allies in that war. The Ebro was the most costly battle of the Civil War, but for the Republicans it came at the end of two years of bitter, unsuccessful fighting. Two years which had transformed Republican hopes into memories of failure. Now failure was behind them. The soldiers of the Republic who crossed the river that day were excited to be on the offensive again. This was great, that we were crossing the Ebro and going to the other side to have a go at them and push them back. And obviously we were hoping to chase them quite a distance, chase them all together on that front anyway. This optimism defied the experience of two years of defeat. Once again, the popular army was attempting to match the enemy in conventional warfare, which would lead to a battle of attrition in which the Republic stood no chance. The attack across the Ebro was probably doomed before it began.
the nationalists now held over two-thirds of Spain. They had split the Republican zone into two. Valencia was under threat. The all-out offensive across the Ebro was meant to ward off this danger. The idea came largely from Juan Negrín, the enigmatic Prime Minister of the Republic, a right-wing socialist and a distinguished professor of medicine. Negrín mirrored many of the contradictions of the Republic. He believed that the only way to fight the war was to halt the revolution and bring the army under disciplined, central control, with himself in command. In this, Negrín was closely supported by the communists. They were tough. They took orders ultimately from Moscow. Their vision of democracy was a world away from Negrín's. Yet he was committed to working with the communists, not least because the Republic needed Soviet aid. Negrín was a subtle, unreadable person. No one knew his real mind. At the same moment that he was secretly initiating peace feelers to Franco, he was also organizing the supreme offensive of the war. At first, the nationalists were taken by surprise. The Republican thrust drove them back in hasty retreat. The hills overlooking the small town of Gandesa, 25 miles inside nationalist territory, now became the new front line. General Franco rushed forward reinforcements pulled out of other battlefronts. In huge, prolonged battles like this, Franco's army had the advantage. It was more mobile, and in the nationalist army orders were more efficiently communicated. It benefited from German and Italian aid, while the Republic's foreign aid had diminished with the renewed closure of the French border. Determined not to yield another yard of ground, Franco took personal command. The Ebro attack was halted and turned into four months of slogging, static battle, the largest and most savage conflict of the whole war. Hill 666 was one of the Republic's most advanced positions. It became a focus of nationalist counterattacks. Bill Bailey and other international brigaders were helping Spanish Republican troops to defend the hill. And that was one case where we prayed, literally prayed for the darkness to come so we could at least get up and stretch our legs, move around. And the bastards, when nighttime came, they threw more shells at us. And uh, then it was a question of watching blazing rockets uh, wasting in air after it would hit the mountainside, throw tons of rock at you. And it wasn't so much the artillery hitting you, it was down the splinters of rock, splashing all over the place. And I have to say that it was one of my most bitter experiences. And I'll speak truthfully and say that there were many times when I figured I would never get off this rock. In the end, the Republican troops were forced off Hill 666, leaving its slopes littered with their dead. Now began the retreat, a retreat which was only to end with the end of the war. Enrique Liste was a Republican corps commander at the Battle of the Ebro. We found ourselves in a situation where we couldn't give up any of our positions. So it was a battle of attrition, in which we were losing our best troops, but we had no choice. By now, there was no choice. Once again, the popular army had attempted to match the enemy in regular combat and failed. Just as it had at Brunetti, Belchite, Teruel. The popular army found it could not defeat the enemy in conventional fighting for defended positions. The Republic had put down the revolution behind its own lines. This meant that the government also avoided revolutionary military tactics. Guerrilla war, invented in Spain as the people's answer to regular armies, was never seriously attempted in the civil war. As it had done before, 
the popular army fought with courage. But once again, in a battle of attrition, it could not prevail against the superior weight and professionalism of the nationalists. Once again, the Republican forces were hammered into retreat. Behind them, they left vast quantities of precious equipment. Failure in battle hardened Negrin's resolve to save the Republic. One strategy was negotiation. The previous May, he had published a moderate 13-point declaration for victory. In reality, a hint that the war could be ended by mediation. Horrified by the sum of death and destruction, Negrin nonetheless remained determined that a democratic Spain should emerge from the ruins. His second strategy pursued the same democratic aims. If peace could not be negotiated, he would fight on in the hope that a greater war between democracy and fascism would explode in Europe, a war which would engulf Spain's own conflict. But Franco would have no compromise. Total victory was within reach. He wanted nothing less. It was an ugly paradox for Negrin, that as he saw it, only Hitler, Franco's ally, could save him. For it was Germany's continued expansionism which he hoped would touch off war in Europe. Then Negrin hoped that Britain and France would welcome the Spanish Republic as an ally. In 1936, Hitler had occupied the Rhineland with troops. In March 1938, the Germans marched into Austria. Now in September 1938, it was Czechoslovakia's turn. At Munich, the statesmen of Britain and France met Hitler and Mussolini to see if the peace could be saved. For the British and French governments, non-intervention in Spain had been one way of trying to postpone a conflict with Hitler. In spite of the blatant foreign aid to both sides in the Civil War, they were still clinging to this policy. Now came the news of the democracy's pact with Hitler. Once again, the Western democracies had chosen the path of appeasement. While Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, told cheering Londoners that it was peace in our time, Negrin faced the truth. Time was against him. When the Second World War came, it was to be too late to save the Spanish Republic. Munich also lost the Republic, its only effective ally, Stalin. The Soviet leaders decided to change their whole strategy. Munich destroyed Stalin's policy of building an anti-fascist alliance in which the Western democracies would stand together with Russia to block the expansion of Germany and Italy. Now Stalin saw himself isolated. To gain time, he was eventually to sign the Nazi-Soviet pact with Hitler. Now, as his anti-fascist alliance plan collapsed, Stalin's support for the Spanish Republic was abandoned. Hitler must not be provoked. Soviet aid to Spain dwindled. Hitler's policy towards Spain changed too, but in the opposite direction. Realising nothing he did there would cause Britain and France to go to war, he dramatically increased his aid, now keen to end the Spanish war as quickly as possible. There was a huge increase in German military aid to the nationalists. Franco had sent an urgent request for more weapons to clinch the Battle of the Ebro. In return, he agreed to grant Germany generous mining concessions in Spain, and he promised to pay the costs of the German Condor region. But Mussolini decided to reduce his aid to Franco. He accepted the proposal of the Non-Intervention Committee to withdraw foreign volunteers fighting in the Civil War. 10,000 Italians, nearly half the total in Spain, now embarked for home. Those who stayed continued fighting with the Nationalist Army at the Ebro. Negrin 
also agreed that the foreign volunteers on the Republican side should be withdrawn. He was hoping that non-intervention by foreign powers might at last become a reality. The last grim stages of the Battle of the Ebro were still being fought when, on October 29th, the International Brigaders took their farewell. Barcelona showed their gratitude to these survivors of the 40,000 foreigners who had left their homes to fight for the Spanish Republic. La Passionaria spoke proudly to the crowds. These men reached our country as crusaders for freedom. They gave up everything, their country, home and fortune. Fathers, mothers, wives, brothers, sisters and children and they came and told us, we are here. Your cause, Spain's cause, is ours. It is the cause of all advanced and progressive mankind. The departure of foreigners hardly affected the Republic's fighting strength. They had mattered in the first days through their discipline and their message of solidarity, but they had not been militarily decisive. By now, the brigades were mostly manned by Spaniards. Most volunteers went home. Only brigaders from fascist countries had no home to go to. But the war went on. By mid-November, Franco had reconquered the ground he had lost to the Republic in the first two days of the Ebro Offensive. Just before Christmas 1938, the nationalists crossed the Ebro into Catalonia. The fresh aid from Germany had arrived and was proving decisive. The nationalist advance was now meeting little resistance. By mid-January 1939, Tarragona had fallen. By the end of January, Franco was nearing Barcelona. The only party utterly united in determination to fight on were the communists. They used much-needed warplanes to shower leaflets on Barcelona, urging the population to continue the struggle. But Negrin was playing a double game. Outwardly, he went along with the communists. He had little choice. In secret, he pursued his search for a negotiated peace. But the whole political fabric of the Republic was beginning to fall apart around Negrin. Many resented his apparent sympathy with a hard communist line. The anarchists, whose dreams of revolution were dead, were still fighting. But they were fighting for a Republic they didn't believe in. So were the Catalan nationalists, whose treasured autonomy had been eroded by the government's centralist line. The Republic was no longer what it had been. The power of the Catalan government had been wiped out by Negrin, to such an extent that at one point I began to ask myself if I was doing the right thing to continue taking part in the fighting at all. While the communists were trying to boast of public morale, Others used their most brutal means to destroy it. For months now, Barcelona had been the target of bombing raids. The previous March, Italian bombers had battered the city in waves that kept coming for 48 hours. The port and the city centre had been particularly badly damaged. The air attacks had continued ever since. But those March raids stayed in Barcelona's memory as the most terrifying. If I tell you that more than half of Barcelona fled to shelter in the hills and woods around Barcelona, you'll understand what the bombings were like. I was assigned to the casualty post in the Calle Sepulveda, and whenever there was a raid, which was about every three hours, we were told where to go to pick up those not seriously wounded. Sometimes, while we were doing this, we were caught by the next bomb, so we had to start all over again. A lot of people from the Red Cross, plus a lot of those whose cars had been commandeered for this, were killed in those attacks. 
the bombing of Barcelona came after the air raids on Madrid, Durango and Guernica. But the bombing of Barcelona went on for months. Aimed at cowing the civilian population by its destructive power, it generated a sullen hatred. Since the Republicans had been cut in two, there were fewer refugees coming into Barcelona. Those who did travelled on north as fast as possible. But they had all told the same story. A story of what took place when the nationalists had captured and occupied their villages and towns. A story of death and persecution. The closer the nationalists got to Barcelona, the more these stories terrified the population. By January 24th, the nationalists were less than five miles away. In Barcelona, people realized that all was lost, in spite of some talk of setting up a line of resistance. No one believed it, because they really just wanted the whole thing to be over. And you'd hear people say, it doesn't matter how it ends, only let it end soon. I heard that quite often in my neighborhood, doesn't matter how it ends, only let it end soon. The Catalans joined the refugee torrent. Many struggled up the high mountain passes of the Pyrenees. France meant safety. They traveled by day and night. Barcelona on the morning of January 26th. From all sides, the nationalist forces moved in. The tanks rumbled down the diagonal. The infantry marched down the slopes above the city. A few communists tried to build barricades. They soon gave up. The fascist soldiers were already coming down the hillside. It was a very sunny day in Barcelona, one of those very radiant days, and the bayonets of their rifles glinted menacingly in the sunlight. That vision was terrifying, but the truth is that they didn't scare us. But we knew we had to run. We ran and ran as fast as we could. We left the cobblestones by the side of the tram lines. Of those who stayed, many now welcomed the nationalist columns led by General Yagüe. For them, it was a joyous moment. The hour of rescue, the end of a revolutionary nightmare. Free to practice their religion openly for the first time in nearly three years, they praised God and Franco for victory. Some of the Catalan middle class were much less certain. Long tired of the war, they must now have feared the future. Often liberals, they had no sympathy for Franco's regime. I knew very well he had none for Catalan autonomy. And the prospect was bleak for communists, anarchists and socialists still in Barcelona. The revenge killings were about to begin. Near the French frontier, and the fortress of Figueres, Negrin called a secret meeting of the Cortes. Held at night, 
in the subterranean vaults. This was the last session of the Republican Cortes on Spanish soil. One of the few foreigners present was the British journalist, Willie Forrest. Well, Negrin got up first to speak and started by reading from a prepared text. But uh, as he proceeded, he sort of threw his script aside and started walking up and down, and some sort of fire came into his voice. Negrin announced that the 13 points of the government's program were being cut to three. It was the last point which now mattered most. Franco must give a guarantee, a cast-iron guarantee, that after the war there would be no reprisals by the victors against the vanquished. The victors were now sweeping northwards towards the French border. One week after Negrin left Figueres, they took the town. They were a mere 20 miles away from the frontier. For the Republicans, it was no longer retreat, but flight. Negrin and his ministers left Spain. Out of them poured the remnants of the Republican army in Catalonia, packed together with half a million refugees. 5,000 human beings crossed the border every hour. On the other side lay only the misery, hunger and overcrowding of French internment camps. The nationalists reached the last border post and closed it. Catalonia had fallen. For these people, the war was over. But Madrid, and more than a quarter of Spain, was still Republican. Negrin was still Prime Minister. He knew he must go back to Spain to save what could be saved by war or compromise. But Franco had no intention of accepting Negrin's latest peace initiative. He wanted only unconditional surrender. March 1939, Moroccan tribesmen, the Moors, were among the nationalist troops who had been besieging Madrid for over two years. The Moorish trenches had become almost a North African village. To the east, they could see the rooftops of Madrid. In the city itself, nationalist supporters have for two and a half years been trying to live unnoticed. Enrique Meret Magdalena, they're taking refuge in the Paraguayan embassy. During those two and a bit years, we always spoke in whispers and kept the blinds drawn so nobody would know how many people were inside the one flat. There were between 50 and 60 of us. For the Madrid population, Republicans and secret nationalists alike, hunger was now the worst torment. Even vegetable roots became a precious form of food. People stood all day in queues, ready to buy anything which arrived in the denuded shops. Hunger and sheer exhaustion of wartime life were sapping the will to fight on. Negrin, the Prime Minister, had flown back to Spain. Surrounding himself by communists, whom he promoted to a series of vital military commands, he established himself near Alicante. In what was left of the Republic, there were still four armies adding up to half a million men. The army commander in Madrid, Colonel Casado, 
believed that Negrin's reliance on the communists was a major stumbling block to winning peace concessions. He had put out his own peace feeders to the nationalists. Now, to back this, he launched what was in effect a coup d'etat in Madrid. Negrin and his colleagues were at dinner near Alicante when they heard Casado attacking them over the radio. Willie Forrest was there. There was a telephone in the dining room and Negrin went over to it and asked to be put through to Casado. He had to hang up for a minute and wait, but then the phone rang. Negrin went over. It was Casado on the line. What's going on? was the first words that I heard Negrin say. I couldn't hear, of course, Casado's replies, but they, from what Negrin said afterwards, it was quite clear. Because what Negrin said was, You've rebelled? Against whom, may I ask? Against me? Then consider yourself relieved of your command. And with that, Negrin slammed down the telephone and, turning to his ministers, he asked them to follow him upstairs for another cabinet meeting. It was to be a crucial night for Prime Minister Negrin, a night that settled his fate and the fate of the Republic. Clearly, Negrin's political position was collapsing. The communist leaders decided not to organize resistance to the Casado coup. Whether this reflected Stalin's current disinterest in Spain and whether this clinched Negrin's decision to flee remain open questions. At three in the morning, Willie Forrest watched as Negrin and his government filed out of their last meeting. Well, that, as I said, was the end. We who were there didn't need to be told of the government's decision to quit. We, we saw the ministerial bags being packed. We saw Senor Garthis, the police chief, going through his dossiers and tearing up papers. And we knew that uh, Cisneros, the Air Force chief, had gone off in great haste to a, an airfield about 20, at Monova, about 20 miles from where we were, to organize a couple of planes for the government's escape. As Negrin left Spain for the last time, chaotic shooting broke out inside Madrid. Casado's supporters fought communist units who did not know or couldn't believe that their leaders had decided not to resist the Casado coup. Once again, the Republic was tearing itself apart. For two weeks, Casado attempted to negotiate an honorable peace. His efforts were to prove as vain as Negrin's. Franco broke off contact with him. Casado now had no choice. He ordered the Republican armies to raise the white flag and surrender. The nationalists, in the end, never had to fight to capture Madrid. Unopposed, they walked in. I woke up and I heard shouts and I thought somebody's gone mad and now we're going to be in real trouble, just when the war is about to finish. And then I came out and I heard shouts, Viva España, Viva España. And I said, what are you shouting for? You've all gone crazy. They replied, no, no, Madrid has been liberated. The war is over. And then we all jumped from the balcony into the street. I took my brother with me and we went out to see what was happening in the streets. I reckon that even some of those who'd taken part in the events of the 14th of April 1931 were now the ones who climbed onto lorries. I think they were more or less the same people. Or at least, there were just as many of them, and they were equally enthusiastic. As Franco's soldiers trudged into the streets of Madrid, Palanque's supporters poured out of hiding. Republicans, trying to escape from nationalist vengeance, headed for the port of Alicante on the southeastern coast, chosen as the main evacuation point. On March 28th, as Madrid fell, this British ship left Alicante. On board were some 500 Republicans, mostly leading figures. Left behind were about 20,000 refugees who were swarming into the harbour area, hoping desperately for ships to rescue them. For these three survivors, Natiso Julian, Eduardo de Guzman, and his sister-in-law, Encarnacion Bueno, what followed is an indelible memory. Well, we were looking out towards the horizon. We could see a few lights. Some people were saying that they were our boats, that they were getting nearer. 
This was the worst torture of the harbour, the torment of hope, thinking you were going to be saved when there was no salvation possible. I remember every single moment. Each was more terrible than the one before. Every minute that passed without the boats arriving made me believe less and less in boats, in anything. My son was saying, you'll see, Mum, you'll see, we'll get away. But when the hours passed and no boats came near, I stopped believing in anything. By March 30th, Italian troops had occupied the fortress overlooking the harbour. The Republicans crowded along this quay were at their mercy. The last boats had gone. Now there was no hope, only fear. I was sitting there, my son next to me, we were talking. We knew already that the boats were not coming. Along came a man of about 40, strong, good-looking, a man who looked in really good health. He came quite close to me. I didn't realize what was happening. I heard a shot. He'd shot himself and fallen down right there. I totally lost my calm then. My son was saying, don't be frightened, mother. Don't be scared. You'll see a lot more of this here, but don't be frightened. But of course, I was scared stiff. I don't know what I thought. Perhaps that they would bring out machine guns and finish us all off. Nationalist troops moved into Alicante to reinforce the Italians. The helpless masses in the harbour knew that they would be rounded up the following day. For the anarchists amongst them, one question remained to be settled in the last hours of liberty. And we spent the whole night discussing what we should do from a revolutionary viewpoint, without giving ourselves any false illusions about escaping death. But what was the best thing for the cause we had all defended? Should we give ourselves up or kill ourselves? This was the last minute dilemma, what we were debating that last night. These were the two points of view. Emile said, this was a comrade called Mario Emil. He said, I'm not sparing them any crimes. If they want me dead, they'll have to kill me. Nobody on the quayside slept that night. Through the darkness of March 31st, this macabre debate was argued to its conclusion. Many agreed with Guthman's friend to stay alive and let the enemy take the ultimate guilt. But others made suicide pacts. Eduardo de Guzman recalls the last two to die. After that last discussion, when we were about to leave, they took each other by the hand and saying, this is our last protest against fascism, they raised their pistols to each other's heads and shot each other. As we were leaving the port, somebody said, we'll soon be envying the dead. And I thought, no, we'd better start envying them now. Few today remember that Alicante port was the place of the Republic's last agony. Nearly three years after the army insurrection, the war was over. The guns fell silent. The church bells began to ring. Over the radio, a nationalist announcer delivered Franco's final war communique. In the day of today, cautivo and disarmed the Ejército Rojo, han alcanzado las tropas nacionales sus últimos objetivos militares. La guerra ha terminado. Burgos, primero de abril de 1939, año de la victoria. El generalísimo Franco. April 2nd, 1939, the day after the war's official end, was Palm Sunday. In Madrid, Generalissimo Franco went to lay a sword of victory in the Church of Santa Barbara. It was the first of many triumphal occasions in which Franco and Spain celebrated the nationalist victory.
What would Spain be like under Franco? The fighting was over, but the so-called national crusade had a long way to run. Spain was to be transformed, but into an image of the past. Out of the turmoil of the Republic, the Spain of history was to be resurrected, ruled once more by the church, the oligarchy, the great landowners. There was to be a fatherland at once new and ancient, a nation united, obedient, purged of evil. Franco decreed, retroactively, that all who had opposed the nationalists would be answerable. Even pre-war political opponents were not to be spared. He saw the main threat in the working class, once triumphant, now prostrate. Here, the purge must be most harsh. It began at once, among the new hordes of his captives. Nobody suspected of Republican sympathies was safe. Concentration camps all over Spain were swamped by hundreds of thousands of prisoners. The captives from the harbour at Alicante were brought here, to this barren place, which was then the concentration camp of Albatera. It is said that Franco personally ordered that there should be no photographs of the camp. When it had served its purpose, every trace of it was cleared away. All that remains today is an old hut used by the guards and a path once trodden by 30,000 arriving prisoners. But the camp can never be clear from the memories of those who survived Albatera. The repression began right from the start. We were never considered human beings. That's the way it was under Franco. We were always considered as things, never as human beings. Albatera was not just an internment camp. It was also a camp where people awaited selection for execution. Through the gate which used to stand here, the visitors arrived. These were the moments of terror, for these visitors were members of the Falanque, who came to identify their enemies. They were looking for people from their towns, or anyone else of note, anyone who'd been a volunteer or fought in the Republican army, or anyone who'd been mayor or any other official in any Republican town in Spain. And they picked these people out right there and then. This one, this one, this one. And without more ado, just took them off. They took them away to their respective villages. But most of the time, these prisoners never reached their destination. What usually happened was that we heard the shots from here, and that was the end of them. There were also executions within the camp. The prisoners were forced to watch them. I remember the first executions. I'd been locked up in a punishment area. Well, there were three lads they shot. They'd lined us up at machine gun point. And one of the lads, a commissar, said to everyone, keep calm, comrades, don't make a move. They'll use it as an excuse to kill us all. And they shot him right there in front of us. Nobody knows how many of the 30,000 who went into Albatera perished by execution or just callous neglect. Most people know what the Nazi extermination camps were like. They've seen films of them. I think that the Albatera camp was in many ways like those extermination camps, except it was less systematic. Everything here was less organized. In the concentration camps, persecution was still haphazard. But soon, the policy of systematic repression began. The prison population increased by over 200,000 people. There were token trials, rapid sentences, executions. The terror lasted at this pitch for more than four years, longer than the war itself. Many, like Narciso Julian and Eduardo de Guzman, suffered for much longer. Both were sentenced to death. Eduardo de Guzman spent nine years in prison. He and Narciso Julian, like many others, waited to be executed for over a year, never knowing if the next day was to be their last. Narciso Julian was to spend 25 years in prison. This part of the prison yard, the Jezarias, still holds special memories for him. 
1945, he met his daughter there. In 1965, 20 years later, he met his granddaughter in the same spot. But for nationalist families, the suppression of all dissent meant unity. Tomas Garicano Gonye, later one of Franco's ministers, found a solid logic in Franco's persecutions. The repression was aimed at preventing any possible reaction from any communists or socialists still at liberty in Spain or living abroad in exile, in case they returned to Spain, to turn the situation on its heels and take power again. As the corpse of Jose Antonio Primo de Rivera was carried from Alicante to Madrid, Republican supporters in villages along the road were shot without even the hearing the 15th century Inquisition had given its victims. Franco was hammering Spain into a political monolith without opposition. The Falanque, which had stood for a revolutionary fascism, had already been forcibly integrated into an ultra-conservative one-party state. But the dead Jose Antonio, a charismatic leader of the Falanque executed by the Republicans, was now appointed patron saint and martyr of the new Spain. Francisco Franco, El Caudillo, could safely share the leadership of Spain with a dead man who could not contradict the myth imposed on him. All other political movements were forbidden. Regional autonomy and diversity were obliterated. Such was Franco's version of national unity, and many in the Spanish middle class greeted it with rapture. Las procesiones en aquellos momentos tenían un auge fenomenal. There was an extraordinary boom in processions, Holy Week processions and processions for just about every saint. They were packed with people marching along. There was a revival of all this sort of thing that had disappeared under the Republic. These things seemed important to us then. They gave us the impression of recovering something that we had lost. Los valores eh, religiosos, los valores patrióticos. The religious values, religiosos, patriotic values, todo eso, the values of order, all these were restored. Las libertades, pero lógicamente los que teníamos una vida... There was an absence of freedom, but logically those of us that had well-ordered lives those of us who were professionals and saw things from the personal viewpoint only, we felt very much at ease and happy. In this ruined Spain, the first years of peace were even harder in their way than the war. The country lost hundreds of thousands of refugees who were forced to remain in exile. And in Spain, to the physical destruction were added famine, mass unemployment, impoverishment. Many thousands died of starvation. Thousands more were shot. For there was no magnanimity in Franco, no gift of reconciliation. And nationalists everywhere at every level became infected with their leader's lust for revenge. What happened in masterless matters happened throughout Spain. The Molinaire family had worked this plot of land for many years. Juan Molinaire was a young man in 1938. He and his family were socialists. When the nationalists swept into Aragon, they had fled with other refugees towards Valencia. Franco <laughs> dijo que. And when the war finished, Franco said we shouldn't be afraid to return to our villages. And of course, since we weren't guilty of anything, we came back. 
When we arrived here, they arrested us. They wouldn't even let us out of jail. Molinaire's father was imprisoned by the local Falanque, who now controlled masterless matters. Juan was never to see his father again. Forty years later, the memory of his death still pains him. Of course I remember. Those were very critical moments, crucial moments. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. And on top of it all, one has to live with those people, knowing that they had killed him. But you had to go on living with them without saying a word. After every civil war, hatred is the real survivor. Stifled behind closed doors, hidden in neighbors who avert their faces on the village street, the poison trickles down the years. So it was in Spain where almost every family had a hatred to nurse. And yet, as time passed, locked minds began timidly to open again. As my children grew up, they used to chide me because I'd been a Franco supporter. Mum, how on earth could you support Franco? I think that he saved us. But how can you say that? Then they began bringing me books, and books, and more books, and I started to realize that it had been terrible, and that there had been as many monstrosities on this side as there had been on the other side, because I already knew about the other side. And I didn't know what had happened here. And so, gradually, you evolve, and you realize that there is neither good nor evil, as they used to tell you. That you can think for yourself. That something you do not like, someone else may think is fine. That you are in no position to judge others. That someone can think one way while you think another. And he could be just as good a person as you. That is what my children taught me.